Too Much Information is a production of iHeartRadio. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Too Much Information, the show that brings you the secret histories and little-known fascinating facts and figures behind your favorite TV shows, movies, music, and more. We are your two exorcists of extraneous esoterica. <laughs> I'm Alex Heigl. And I'm Jordan Runtalk. Very good. Very nice. Yeah. And Jordan, as you might have gleaned from that, we are talking about one of the most famous horror movies, famous movies period of all time, one that established an entire subgenre, literally revolutionized the motion picture industry, uh, et cetera. And scared me. And scared a young Jordan. We are talking about The Exorcist. Happy holidays, everyone. (laughs) Yeah, Merry Christmas. This was supposed to be closer to Halloween. (laughs) But it's almost on the 50th anniversary of The Exorcist release, so it kind of works. It is. Yes, 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 yes. I can't believe they released it the day after Christmas. That's so (laughs) funny to me. (laughs) It's it's perfect. I mean, what else do you want? Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Uh, This is one of the many classic movies I saw when I was way too young. And then, at least until preparing for this episode, I never saw it again. Uh, (laughs) Such bummers include Midnight Cowboy, Bonnie and Clyde, and Deliverance. I saw them all in middle school, I would say. And uh, yeah, yeah. major bummer. (laughs) But I first became aware of The Exorcist when the 2000 reissue or re-release was included in the trailer of my beloved American Graffiti VHS. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Which means that my obsession with Happy Days nostalgia led me to the Antichrist. And this was also around the same time that I was getting into Austin Powers. And Mike Myers had that great joke as Dr. Evil when his hydraulic chair seems yeah. possessed. You know, he had a very young priest and a very old priest. That was definitely the first time I ever heard the power of Christ compels you. So, yeah, same. <laughs> I think those two pieces of pop culture converged for me and made me curious about checking out The Exorcist. And I don't know about you, Heigl, but there was also an element of forbidden fruit for me because my mom spoke in what I can only describe as awestruck terms about how The Exorcist scared the hell out of her. And Mm. I'm pretty sure this movie is why we weren't allowed to have a Ouija board in the house. (laughs) I'm I'm pretty sure Mr. Howdy did a number on her. Um, I (laughs) Captain Howdy, how dare you? He was in the military. (laughs) Excuse me, Major Howdy. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I watched this movie last night for the first time in probably 20 years. I started watching it on a full-size TV, and then I switched to a laptop because it became too much. And then I minimized <laughs> the screen on the laptop, too, so it was just about three inches square because that was all I could take of The Exorcist. <laughs> I'm just blown away by how contemporary this film feels, which is, again, yeah. nuts considering that's 50 years old. It is really amazing. I, I have, I mean, basically that dovetails with mine. I just, and, and I was reading about it before then because I was such a, like, I just read about horror movies before I saw them. <laughs> that's why we're friends. That's one of the many reasons why we're friends. It was during the glory days of Barnes & Noble. And yeah. My parents would just let me get pretty much any book because if I I was reading that was cool so I would get these huge dumb coffee table books that were like the hundred greatest horror movies of all time and then I had one on cult movies and that's where I read about like Yodorowsky and David Lynch and all that stuff and um, so I knew like everything about these movies before I ever even saw them and it wasn't like a letdown when I saw it but I do remember a little bit being like this this was this, like, destroyed the Western world for, for a period of months. Um, really? Yeah, I I was not, like... I mean, I remember seeing it, I think, around 14 or 15 and being, like, yes, this is uh, upsetting and, mm. and like, disorienting and, and unpleasant. But I don't remember being particularly scared by it because I was kind of just, like... And, you know, apologies to Reagan, but I was, like, why not just lock the door? Because she could use her mind... And- to unlock it. It all kinds of it all kind of happens in the room. All of my fears are about things following me, you know. That's like, interesting. Or trying, to, or trying to get into my house. It's like all all of my recurring nightmares are about either like Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees esque figures, or the dinosaurs from Jurassic Park trying to get into my house. None of them involve like a possessed girl away in a locked room. I mean, I grew up with a sister who was a teenager at one point, so <laughs> I'm familiar with that experience. You just kind of leave him in the room and you go about your day. So, but since I've become more, uh, you know, of a, of a sinist, if you will, 
uh, it really does blow me away. Just how, like you said, how contemporary it feels. And the fact that something like this even a came together. Yeah. Because like, <laughs> what the f- there was no precedent for this other than Rosemary's baby. And the fact that that even came together is nuts, but you know, and then became such an insane, like the amount of money this thing made hand over fist. I had no idea. And yeah. And, um, you know, Friedkin is so fascinating. And, and I, I, I was writing this whole thing with my, uh, Twitter mutual Jesse Hassinger, who is on an episode of the New Flesh podcast, which is m- one of my favorite horror movie podcasts. And he was talking about when William Freakin died and everyone was like, you know, this is huge outpouring of, of grief and sympathy for William Freakin. And he was like, well, you know, I love the French Connection and I love The Exorcist, but there's something that always like... I, I just never really got the hero worship around him or like the obsession with him. And then he he breaks into this sarcastic impression where he's like, ah, oh, you know, my friend Billy Freakin, you know, he would he would shoot guns all the time on the set and he would say such awful things to everyone all the time. He was so mean. Ah, oh, Billy, my pal Billy. And it's, it's, that's all I can think of because he truly was a garbage human. Um, but he was, he has two masterpieces to his name. And if you listen to a bunch of nerds, a couple other really good films, Phil Spector of cinema. Yeah. The fact that he did this is, I think like, I don't think this would have succeeded in anybody else's hands to Mm. be honest. Um, because you know, the whole, the log line on him, or at least the reader's digest version of his directorial style. And also Owen Roisman, who is his uh, cinematographer is like naturalism, like pseudo documentarian, very dry on the street level filming and that grounds all the ridiculousness of this movie and that's why i think it feels contemporary it doesn't have the like scorsese like nut job editing or like dolly zooms and it it just feels so dry and like and i'm speaking purely on like a visual sense it just feels so grounded and real that it's everything that happens is that much more shocking because it's it's like it's how I kind of feel about the original Halloween, where everything is just kind of like flatly shot. I mean, not flat. John Carpenter has these beautiful widescreen compositions, but it's not like snap zoom, uh, psychedelic e- editing. It doesn't even like you. You you know you get that period in the '90s with a lot of horror movies like S- Scream, where the MTV editing comes yeah. in, and instead of like wipes or cuts, they do like shing, shing, like really obnoxious uh sound and, and fast cuts for transitions so you just don't get that here. And- yeah 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 and and i don't you know you just don't get that here and it's and that's what is goes such a long way towards making it effective i don't know your mileage may vary that's really interesting i was actually watching it and i hadn't prepared to mention this to you but while watching it I was trying to think what other directors would do something interesting with the source material, because obviously it's based on a best-selling book. Uh, And I came up with three names, and I'm curious what you think about this. Mm. John Frankenheimer, (laughs) Roman Polanski, which is kind of too easy, and your beloved WC, your beloved JC. I just confused John Carpenter with Water Closet. I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) He would think that was hilarious. (laughs) Um... You know, I don't know a ton about Frankenheimer other than Manchurian Candidate. Seconds with Rock Hudson. Okay. That's a freaky <laughs> uh, movie. I would, I would, I mean, Polanski is, is, like you said, obvious, but, you know, have you ever seen Repulsion? That's a yeah, crazy movie. Yeah, with Catherine movie. Deneuve. Yeah. Yeah. Because I love um, Catherine Deneuve. Downer film. Yeah. Uh, but, he, you know, he would have been great at it. It is funny because Carpenter's early stuff is like, like Dark Star, his first film is like so just fantastical. And even stuff like Assault on Precinct 13 mm. has kind of a fantastical quality in, in to it. And like the gang members are like explicitly supposed to be zombies. <laughs> like they are not supposed, not actual zombies, but like the way that he conceived of it was like, what if you made Night of the Living Dead, but the zombies were gang members? So they're sort of shot in that horror adjacent way. And yeah, I don't know. I It's it's hard to say. I mean, we have a list of candidates that we'll read off. That's true. <laughs> late, uh, shortly. Anywho. Well. From the allegedly possessed kid who inspired the source material and then went on to work for NASA (laughs) to the film's supposedly cursed production to the black exploitation ripoff that was seized and destroyed by Warner Brothers. Here's everything you didn't know about The Exorcist. I want to do, oh God, I want to do so many demon impressions. I I don't know if I can though. Yeah. What an excellent day for an exorcism. Like, there's so much phlegm in that. 
Uh, my favorite one is when he like the door slams shut and he's like, "Did you do that?" And she just goes, mm-hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> "No, it's when the drawer pops open." <laughs> yeah. Oh right, yeah. right, right, right. <laughs> the Exorcist is based on the 1971 novel of the same name by William Peter Blatty, whose childhood is, uh, I would say, essential to understanding the work. Uh, born in New York, Blatty's parents separated when he was a toddler, and he was raised by a deeply religious mother whose sole income came from selling homemade jelly <laughs> on the streets of Manhattan. <laughs> Sounds like Dr. <laughs> Evil's origin story. Yeah, exactly. He was beaten with reeds. Um, uh, per Wikipedia, William Peter Blatty's mother once offered a jar of her jam to Franklin D. Roosevelt when the president was in New York cutting the ribbon for the Queen's <laughs> Midtown Tunnel, telling Roosevelt, it's for when you have company. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, now I wonder how much of the mother in The Exorcist is based on his own. Oh, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I don't feel know like it's about more. Him. She's giving me like Carrie vibes, actually. Oh. Like the mom and like Piper Laurie vibes. <laughs> True. Um, yeah, Blatty is uh, Blatty's yeah. kind of a head case. <laughs> yeah, I feel. Anyway. So he lived at 28 different addresses growing up because they were constantly being evicted because homemade oh, jelly doesn't pay the bills. A, a, yeah, it doesn't pay the bills. He attended a Jesuit prep school on a scholarship and graduated as valedictorian, thus beginning his lifelong love affair with the Jesuits. <laughs> and then subsequently attended Georgetown University in D.C. and then George Washington University, where he earned his master's in English lit. He then enrolled in the Air Force and worked for the CIA in Lebanon in the 1950s. And then returning to D.C. became policy branch chief of the Psychological Warfare Division of the Air Force. Now, as you might imagine, I was not able to find the details of what Blatty did as a psychological warfare expert for the Air Force. But I was able to piece together a somewhat tenuous connection. Um, In one of Blatty's books, he quotes this guy named Dr. Tom Dooley. And Dooley was one of the Americans who were involved in the campaign in uh, Vietnam to get the Catholics to move from the north to the south. And they did this in the crudest way possible, which was by simply um, broadcasting the message through churches and local radio stations that said, the Virgin Mary has departed from the north and Christ has gone to the south. And it was successful. <laughs> so that's a guy Blatty at least looked up to. And it went into Blatty's career as a writer. And that's not even the weirdest thing that we'll, we, we're, we'll get to. Yes. But Jordan, tell us about another popular psychological campaign. Yeah, there was a campaign during the Vietnam War conflict called Operation Wandering Soul, which was a... Um, a morale decimation technique <laughs> where the American troops Don't say booster. Would, would broadcast over the jungles at night to the Viet Cong uh, these horrific sounds and music and these ethereal disembodied voices claiming to be of the war dead, essentially, uh, warning everybody to surrender, basically, these ghostly voices. I think from the sky, weren't they broadcast from speakers over helicopters or I mean, it could be from anything, really? <laughs> Are you asking me as if I have validation of this obscure American war atrocity? I wonder if Blatty had anything to do with that. It sounds like something you would have gotten mixed up in all the way down yeah, to the yeah. weird sound effects. Right. Yeah. So Blatty's first book is called Which Way to Mecca, Jack? Uh, that was published in 1960. It is a humorous biographical work which tells of his IRL long con masquerade as a Saudi Arabian prince in Los Angeles. Really? Uh, And in fact, while still in character, I guess you want to say, as this prince, Blatty appeared as a contestant on Groucho Marx's game show, You Bet Your Life, and he won 10 grand, which was... Uh, enough to allow him to quit his job and write full time. Isn't there a story about Sylvester Stallone being so broke when he wrote Rocky, he had to sell his dog. And the first thing he did when he sold the script was to buy his dog back. (laughs) I did not know that, but that is Dickensian. I was trying to find incidents of uh, weird financial windfalls that writers got that allowed them to 
to like you know write their their big breakthrough, and that was kind of the closest thing I got. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just because I feel like we're never going to talk about the game show You Bet Your Life again, uh, I just want to tell the story about mm. Groucho Marx's probably most infamous ad lib, which kind of sort of didn't really happen. Um, just to just to add a little levity to this fairly dark episode. Go ahead. There's a famous urban legend that a woman named Charlotte Story came on the You Bet Your Life show and revealed to Groucho Marx that she had 20 children. And when Groucho asked why she had chosen to raise such a large family, Mrs. Story is said to have replied, I love my husband, that's why. To which Marx responded, supposedly, I love my cigar, but I take it out of my mouth once in a while. <laughs> which, in the 50s... Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, according to legend, this remark was judged too risque to be aired. And according to the anecdote, it was edited out before the episode of You Bet Your Life was broadcast. Uh, there are elements of truth to this. Marion and Charlotte Story were parents of 20 children, and they had appeared as contestants on the radio version of You Bet Your Life in 1950. Audio recordings of this episode exist, but there is no evidence of the infamous line. Uh, Gracho himself denied that the incident ever took place. He told Roger Ebert in 1972, I get credit all the time for things I never said. You know that line in You Bet Your Life? The guy says he has 17 kids, and I say I smoke a cigar, but I take it out of my mouth occasionally. I never said that. I mean, Groucho's <laughs> one of the great, you know, if, if you've got a great line, he's up there with Yogi Berra for, you know. Quotables. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Snopes has dismissed this urban legend as well, which is sad to me. But speaking of Groucho, there's a story that Friedkin tried to add some levity to the set of The Exorcist uh, by having a scene when Father Marin enters the house, remove his hat, and reveal himself to be Groucho Marx. <laughs> because I guess he stayed in touch with William Peter Blatty after his uh, victorious turn on You Bet Your Life. But well, that's according, adorable. I know, right? I, I, well, wait, it didn't actually happen because according oh. to this myth, which I have not been able to completely verify, but I choose to believe it, Friedkin was sick the day that Groucho was going to come onto the set. And so oh. the idea was scrapped. Um, well, Blatty was a prolific writer. He wrote a lot of uh, not just comedic novels, but also screenplays. Which is so weird. One of his screenplays was A Shot in the Dark, which is one of the Pink Panther movies starring my beloved Peter Sellers as Inspector mm -hmm. Clouseau. He also wrote what I can only describe as The Anti-Exorcist. He wrote a 1970 Henry Mancini musical starring Rock <laughs> Hudson and Julie Andrews called Darling Lily. Uh, huh. Well, uh, where were we? Yes, Blatty eventually turned back to fiction and delivered The Exorcist. The book was inspired by a 1949 case of alleged demonic possession and exorcism that Blatty heard about while he was a student at Georgetown, uh, which is why the university figures so heavily into the plot of the movie. Uh, Eugene Gallagher, who is one of his professors and a priest, excuse me, Father Eugene Gallagher, uh, was a priest at the Jesuit College, told Blatty about a boy who was believed to be in the throes of demonic possession, but had been saved through a series of exorcisms in Maryland and Missouri in 1949. It took six weeks to exorcise him. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a process. A lot of <laughs> chanting. Uh, after decades of only being known as Roland Doe or Robbie Mannheim, the boy in question was identified in 2021 to be Ronald Edwin Hunkeler who went on to a career with NASA where he patented technology to make space shuttles and their panels resistant to extreme heat, helping the Apollo missions of the 1960s from the depths of hell to the moon. The Ronald Hunkler story. Hell uh, to he was, the heavens. <laughs> oh, Ooh, yeah, I, I know. Yeah. Hunkler was born in 1935 and it was 14 when he supposedly heard knocking and scratching sounds coming oh. from his bedroom walls. You don't I like, like that? that? No, I don't. Uh, well, now I know it's going into my psychological campaign <laughs> against you. Uh, from there, things basically unfolded in the exact manner of the book and movie. And this may have been because I have read that both Blatty and Friedkin at points got uh, a copy of the notes that the exercising priests made during this whole six week process. Um, allegedly from Robert J. Henley, who is the president of Georgetown at the time. Uh, sounds grossly unethical, but you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> the family's minister wrote to Duke University's parapsychology lab, which That's rules cool. yeah. about what was going on with Hunkler, detailing how chairs moved with him and one threw him out of it. His bed shook whenever he was in it. 
and uh, tables overturned, furniture slid across the floor, and a picture of Christ on the wall shook in the boy's presence. Um, Hunkler's mother apparently blamed this on an aunt of his who is a spiritualist, and she had taught the boy how to use a Ouija board. Dun, dun, dun. Wait, I am now on the um, parapsychology department at Duke University uh, website. Uh, on the landing page, there is a picture of one of their professors in the 50s testing a dog. They're just at a <laughs> table. And the logo for this, I- I'm going to send it to you so that you can verify this because it sounds like I'm making it up, is the <laughs> devil reading a book. Yeah, you know, North Carolina in the research triangle has like a whole thing with, yes, yep, that is true. Uh, J.B. Ryan testing a dog. And scroll um, all the way down. Yep, that is a logo of the devil with a pitchfork in one hand and a (laughs) A textbook in the other. other. A little bit on the nose, guys. Um, So Hunkler underwent a series of uh, medical and psychological tests, um, and then his family uh, sought out religious teachers, beginning with a Protestant pastor. And (laughs) We all know the Protestants. Like, what are they going to do, you know? Uh, Things proceeded to the point where he was moved to St. Louis for an exorcism. Uh, and that's where a lot of other aspects from the book and film, like the messages that were supposedly scratched into his body, took place. By mid-April, the boy was back to normal. So the this the story was then written up in the Washington Post in August of 1949, where Blatty's professor presumably read it, and we were off to the races. Though the case was well known in Jesuit circles for years after the exorcism, several authors began sniffing into the story, including a guy named Mark Opasnik who was among the first to research the story in a 2016 book called The Real Story Behind the Exorcist, in which he concluded, there is simply too much evidence that indicates, as a boy, Roland Doe had serious emotional problems stemming from his home life. There is not one shred of hard evidence to support the notion of demonic possession. In another book, Diabolical Possession and the Case Behind the Exorcist, a writer named Sergio Rueda reported a friend of the family explained that Hunker was spoiled by his father and his mother was stricter, but very superstitious, leading the aforementioned family priest, the Protestant, to initially believe that Hunkler may have manipulated her. To which I say, no sh**. This is great. Great scoop by the New York Post. In 2021, they tracked down a female companion of 29 years of Hunkler, who described him as not religious, and she told the paper, he said he wasn't possessed, it was all concocted. He said, I was just a bad boy. (laughs) Uh, the Post confirmed that Hunkler died in 2020 at the age of 85 and was cremated, though not before receiving the Catholic last rites from a priest who showed up at their home without being called to do so. Did he then walk through the door without opening it as he departed? All right, sorry, keep going. <laughs> Anyway, this story of exorcism stayed lodged in William Peter Blatty's mind for years. I wasn't just impressed, I was excited, he later wrote of reading the Washington Post story. In his 1974 book, William Peter Blatty on The Exorcist, from novel to film, he explained... He's written two about it. (laughs) For here at last, in this city, in my time, was tangible evidence of transcendence. If they were demons, they were angels, and probably a god and a life everlasting. But no. He's so f***ing Catholic. <laughs> he died in Sorry. 2017, four years before this guy admitted that he made the whole possession thing up. Which, in a way, I'm glad. Yeah. You know. That would have really bummed lived- him out. That would have probably yeah. destroyed him. After seeing a film adaptation of Ira Levin's Rosemary's Baby in 1968 by the aforementioned Roman Polanski, Blatty was inspired to tackle the Exorcist project, believing he could improve on what he thought was Rosemary's Baby's cheesy ending. He pitched this. <laughs> One of the most downer and horrifying endings of all time. What have you done to its eyes? Like... <laughs> <laughs> oh, the cheesy, the cheesy, his words, not mine, I should say. Yeah. Yes. Blatty pitched his story to an editor at Bantam Books at a cocktail party. That is some heavy stuff for cocktail chit chat. <laughs> hey, I want to write a novel about demonic possession. Yeah, it's based on a real story <laughs> of this kid. He received a $25,000 advance, which is well over $200,000 in today's money. Ah, publishing in the mid 20th century. How a cocktail chit chat can turn into a quarter million dollars. Mm. He started writing the book at home in Encino, California, 
bolstered by speed pills, which helped him write 16 hours a day. Ah, oh, oh, the mid 60s. Yes. <laughs> what a great life. Uh, your quarter million dollar advance check, your your bowl of pills. What more does a man need? <laughs> Characters in his Exorcist novel were inspired by real life figures. Blatty had met a British archaeologist named Gerald Lancaster Harding in Beirut, presumably during his time in. Can I just say that he was a CIA spook? He must have been. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, this man excavated the caves where the Dead Sea Scrolls had been found, which I can only imagine what else he found that he didn't tell us about. <laughs> <laughs> so this archaeologist, plus a Jesuit theologian named Pierre Telhard de Chardon, who was mm. also a trained archaeologist, went into the character of Father Lancaster Marin, who was played by Max von Sydow. Other historical exorcisms appear in the novel, the Le Du Possessions, a notorious witchcraft trial that took place in France in 1634, and the Louvier Possession, which took place in Normandy a little over a decade later. They get mentioned as part of the research that Father Karras does. A character of the book also tells a story about a fraudulent medium who had studied to be a Jesuit priest. That was a real account uh, published in the Proceedings of the Society for Psychical Research, volume 114. 1930. Psychical. Uh, psychical, yeah. Uh, Bl Blatty didn't look particularly far for his inspiration for Reagan's mother, Chris McNeil, though. Uh, at one point, he lived next door to actress Shirley MacLaine, whose name is almost an anagram for McNeil. Hmm. And when Blatty knew MacLaine, she, like the actress Chris McNeil in the book, had a married European couple as her household staff. And Blatty even incorporated real-life quotes from Shirley MacLaine into the novel's dialogue. So... Uh, there's your, if you take away one bit of, uh, of pub trivia from this, Chris McNeil and the Exorcist is based on Shirley MacLaine. Which kind of makes a lot of sense because Shirley MacLaine's a real freak. And I mean that in the best <laughs> way. Did, did you know this? No, I didn't. Oh, she's famously into all sorts of supernatural phenomena. She wrote a book that actually my girlfriend was reading recently, a 1983 book called Out on a Limb, in which she discusses all manner of new age topics from reincarnation, meditation, trance channeling, and even UFOs. Uh, for example, she's claimed that in a previous life, she lived in Atlantis and was a brother of a 35,000-year-old spirit named Ramtha. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, Jimmy Carter, she, she's apparently such a well-known um, expert on the topic. Jimmy Carter asked her to speak about UFOs with him, uh, which she has claimed to have seen many times from her ranch in the southwestern United States. So she's pretty cool. To be a fly on that wall. <laughs> Jimmy Carter and Shirley McLean talking <laughs> about UFOs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Exorcist initially received mixed reviews and not much coverage. Uh, Blatty was on a 26-city book tour, and he kept arriving in cities to find that bookstores who were uncomfortable with the work had returned their copies to the publisher. But the book's fortunes were turned around by a stroke of completely random luck. Blatty had pre-auditioned to be on your beloved Dick Cavett show yes. weeks before and had been told not to expect an invitation. A producer told him, Cavett's a total non-believer, and he'll just wrinkle up his nose at this. But then a guest had to drop out at the last minute, and the show reached up to Blatty. And uh, they, he and Cavett had an on-air conversation about whether or not the devil actually existed. And it was so made for such good TV that uh, the book was number one on the New York Times bestseller list two weeks later. It stayed there for four months, parking in the top ten for over a year. Ultimately, it sold more than 13 million copies in the United States alone. Perhaps fittingly, uh, given that he was inspired by Rosemary's Baby, another book into prestige film adaptation, Blatty had an eye on a film version of The Exorcist from the beginning. Uh, one early stumbling point was that he insisted that he write the screenplay and be attached as a producer, uh, something that caused Shirley MacLaine's people to drop out of working on the film with him. He also, at one point, I think, offered to forfeit all of his uh, royalties from it to Friedkin if Friedkin would let him play Father Karras. So <laughs> Blad Bladdy's insistence on inserting himself into this film at any and all costs to his personal and professional reputation is truly a thing to behold, uh, a lesson to us all. Um, among the early directors floated for the project were Stanley Kubrick, Arthur Penn, Peter Bogdanovich, and Mike Nichols. But Blatty also supposedly had William Friedkin in mind from the start, but Friedkin was considered an unknown quantity, and it wasn't until everyone else had passed and then the French Connection came out 
and was a huge hit that Warner Brothers acquiesced. Uh, Blatty was surprised when Friedkin asked him to redo the screenplay to make it uh, as uh, accurate to the, the book's dialogue as possible. Uh, in the aforementioned book, one of his books on the subject, he wrote, Even where changes I'd made in the dialogue were only slight, Billy would cringe and ask that I keep the dialogue exactly as it had been in the book. Some subplots were trimmed, and there were other changes made to keep things from going too far off the rails. The crucifix scene in the book was more prolonged and explicit, and the film also declined to mention that in the book, Reagan, while possessed, suffered from constant diarrhea. That's my edit of the of the Exorcist. I do a re-edit of the entire film. It's just put constant farting and shitting noises in there. Uh, I'm a child. Friedkin recalled to the Hollywood Reporter that he'd once taken a meeting about directing a film adaptation of Peter Gunn, um, and he said, "I didn't care for the script at all, and said so in rather graphic terms." As I was leaving the office to go to the parking lot at Paramount. Along comes this fellow who introduced himself as Bill Blatty. I didn't know he'd written the script, but he said, Thanks for saying that. We all think the script needs a lot of work. I appreciate that you were honest, even if it cost you a job. Blatty was apparently so struck by this moment that, uh, despite not seeing anything Friedkin had directed in the intervening years, sent him a copy of The Exorcist uh, while he was on a press tour for The French Connection. Friedkin canceled his appointments that night and read the book overnight uh, and loved it. Uh, he got back in touch with Blatty and Friedkin recalled Blatty telling him, you're the only director I've met who hasn't bullshitted me. I really appreciate that. And I think that's the kind of relationship I need to get this story made the way I'd like to see it made. And then uh, <laughs> Blatty added, Friedkin kept threatening Warners that he'd go on Johnny Carson and tell Carson's audience that Warners was going to hire a director he didn't want. <laughs> what a dick. I love him so much. <laughs> In addition to his appreciating Friedkin's ability to give it to him straight, he also, as you mentioned earlier, liked the realism of the French connection, which is something that he wanted for this film as well. Um, Mike Nichols would have been a really interesting choice to direct The Exorcist because, I mean, I mostly think of him as, you know, being one half of Nichols and May, the comedy duo, yeah. and directing The Graduate. But he also directed The Day of the Dolphin. Have you ever heard of this movie? The Day of the Dolphin? Yeah. It's this weird... Roman Polanski was working on it when Sharon Tate was killed, and he ended up stepping back for obvious reasons to recover. And it went to Mike Nichols. It's this weird, like... I guess you'd call it a psychological thriller movie about government operatives trying to teach dolphins how to communicate with humans. It's really this bizarre sci-fi thriller movie. So in a weird way, the Roman Polanski to Mike Nichols to Exorcist makes sense. Connection it makes a weird sort of sense. Yeah. Well, Friedkin said of the other directors who turned down the project, Stanley Kubrick said, I only like to develop my own stuff. And he changed his attitude about that when he did The Shining, but that was his excuse. Arthur Penn had just done Bonnie and Clyde and said he didn't want to do anything else about violence, especially with a child. Nichols thought it was going to be impossible to pin this story on the acting of a 12-year-old girl. None of this stuff bothered me. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you think was a bigger bastard, Blatty or Friedkin? Probably Friedkin. I think, I, yeah, I, I don't think Blatty was as cruel as freaking i think he was just <laughs> on very... the personal level he did work as a cia psychological warfare well <laughs> that's true Vladdy is so fascinating to me just he's so catholic <laughs> and just like such a unique uh psychological makeup um i don't i don't know uh But yeah, I think it was freaking. <laughs> um, Jack Nicholson was floated as an early choice to play uh, Karis. I guess Freakin thought he was, quote, too unholy to get away with playing a priest. Yeah, which is hilarious considering he would actually go on to play the devil in The Witches of Eastwick. Oh, yeah. Uh, Roy Schneider and Ooh. Paul Newman were also floated. Swoon. I know. But this was yeah. just par for the course at the at the tail end of the 60s. They were just throwing those guys anything. <laughs> and so was Gene Hackman. 
I can see that really working because he would have been fresh off his role as a priest who's losing his faith in the Poseidon adventure. And he also has his background with William Friedkin and the French connection. I almost wonder if it was too on the nose and that's why he didn't either accept it or get it. Yeah, that makes sense. I also saw that MASH star Alan Alda was either offered the role or, or encouraged to audition, but he declined because he didn't like the book. Hey, the power of Christ compels you. <laughs> That's really good. Can I get another martini in here? <laughs> wow, that's really good. Wait, do more. <laughs> no, that's all I can get. Okay. Wow. I've never heard your Alan Alda. <laughs> can you do radar? <laughs> no, I don't need think so. Need some helium for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've also heard Al Pacino was considered, which... He kind of looks like <laughs> Jason Miller with the sad yeah. eyes and the... Yeah, you know. well, he's Italian, so yeah. there's automatically half the Catholic points there. <laughs> <laughs> I like to imagine late era scent of a woman, Pacino. <laughs> 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 Throws the holy water on her, she arrives and says, hoo <laughs> uh, <laughs> Too easy, too how, easy. How could you do late era Pacino doing the power of Christ compels you? <laughs> I just yeah, it doesn't, just yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Pacino has he done anything like explicitly Catholic? Do you think he's super? I mean, other than Godfather, Godfather, which is yeah, I was gonna um, say Layton. Um, I don't think so. Serpico, nah. Has Pacino ever played a priest? No, he was also the devil again. Another actor who went on <laughs> to play the devil in The Devil's Advocate. Oh um, right. Wow, the exorcist to playing Satan pipeline. Uh, the role, anyway, ended up going to record scratch character actor Stacy Keach. I don't uh, get it. Yeah, I don't even, I, I had no idea, but apparently Keach was like quite a young Turk on the theater scene at the time. He was 30 and had all this huge groundswell of theatrical enthusiasm for him based on work that he'd done on Broadway, off Broadway. But. Fate conspired to bring Friedkin and actor-writer Jason Miller together. Friedkin was watching Miller performing in the play that he had written, The Championship Season, which later won a Pulitzer, on Broadway, and asked to speak with him. Uh, he wanted to pick his brain about the themes of lapsed Catholicism in both Miller's play and The Exorcist. Miller, at the time, uh, before Championship Season broke, was kind of a nobody. He was working as a milk delivery man in Flushing. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds grim. Freakin offhandedly gave Miller his copy of The Exorcist, and he was surprised when Miller called him back after reading the novel and told him, that guy is me. And in fairness to Stacey Keach, whose contract had already been signed, uh, Miller had gone to Catholic school and had at one point even studied to be a Jesuit priest for three years at Catholic University of America in D.C. until experiencing a crisis of faith. So he actually, yes, he was that guy. <laughs> Freakin thanked him, but told Keach, he told him Stacy Keach is already the ink dries on the deal. Uh, undeterred, Miller asked for a screen test, took a train to L.A., literally across the country, to do a scene with Ellen Burstyn. And then after that, Freakin had Burstyn interview Miller about his life. Like, And this was apparently something he did also with Linda Blair, where he just had Ellen Burstyn um, facing away from the camera, just talking to... Uh, Jason Miller and Linda Blair and just kind of asking them documentary style journalist style questions about their life um, and then he had Jason Miller give a Catholic mass as if he was doing it for the first time hell of an audition this is all from Friedkin's autobiography which I would be remiss in my duties if I didn't mention was called the Friedkin connection <laughs> uh, it would only be better if he called it the Friedkin cyst <laughs> The power um, of freaking compels you. Yes. <laughs> he really should have called it that, <laughs> considering his directing style. Uh, Miller had obviously done stage acting, but he had never appeared in a film. And Friedkin was swayed by, in his own words, Miller's dark good looks, haunted eyes, quiet intensity, and low, compassionate voice. <laughs> he does have quite the haunted mien yeah. to him. Uh, so the studio bought out Stacey Keach's contract at Friedkin's insistence. Uh, there's a great documentary called Leap of Faith uh, where uh, Freakin just basically sits in a chair and talks about The Exorcist at the screen for like two hours. <laughs> um, what a guy. Billy Freakin. Just a quick word about Father Karras' mother who is played by 
Vansilki Mediaros. How's that? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Uh, pretty good. Uh, she was reportedly discovered by Freakin in a Greek restaurant. And like Jason Miller, she'd had no film experience prior to this. She'd only done Greek stage dramas. And she was reportedly cast because she reminded both Friedkin and William Peter Blatty of their mothers. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, well, this is the point where we all have to do, why you do this to me, Timmy? Timmy, Timmy why you do this to me? <laughs> uh, so after losing Shirley MacLaine, Jane Fonda was another choice to play huh. uh, Chris McNeil. She was deemed too beautiful. Uh, William Freakin said that she uh, responded in a telegram. Why would any studio want to make this capitalist ripoff bullshit? <laughs> What's capitalist about demonic possession? You know, she was in her Hanoi Jane phase, uh, so yeah, she yeah. probably just called everything capitalist ripoff bullshit. <laughs> and then she married Ted Turner, the definition of capitalism. So and bullshit and bullshit. <laughs> Later, she supposedly apologized, clarifying, the reason I didn't want to do it is because I don't believe in magic. Oh. Which surely didn't make her many friends in the Catholic Church referring to religion as magic. Oh, I love Jane Fonda. Um, then Ted Ashley, who was at the time the head of Warners, uh, floated Audrey Hepburn and Anne Bancroft as well. Hepburn said she would do it, but she would only film in Rome, where she was living at the time. Freakin wrote, I thought it was a request on her part, not a condition. No way did I want to film in Rome. It was impractical from every standpoint. All other actors would have to be imported from the United States, and I didn't want a language barrier with the crew. We asked Miss Hepburn to reconsider, but she declined. Anne Bancroft accepted the role, but she was pregnant and asked production to hold on for a year, so she was also out. And this is the craziest thing. Freakin also wanted uh, Carol Burnett to play <laughs> Chris McNeil. He supposedly saw through her her comedic personality to the depth of of acting within. I think that's what something about what he said. I, I'm not just making fun of Carol Burnett, who's obviously incredible, but he was like, "No, I think she could carry a dramatic role like this." He says the entire role with like pantomime painted cheeks and like <laughs> freckles Prince into on the her Tarzan face. yell at one yeah. point. <laughs> that's really bizarre. I mean, all well, can, I just want to say something. I don't understand why the character of Chris McNeil had to be an actress in this movie. I don't know if that was a vestige of the novel, which I've admittedly never read. I don't think it adds anything to the plot. I don't understand why she just wasn't, I don't know, a single mother. I don't really understand what it it adds to the story. Uh, yeah, neither do I. <laughs> Actually. Okay. Have you read the novel? I have not. I have not. No, maybe I will. Yeah, now I kind of want to. I wonder if that's, like, explored more. Well, the person who did get the role of Chris McNeil, Ellen Burstyn, campaigned for the part with a similar intensity to Jason Miller. She apparently called William Friedkin and asked, Do you believe in destiny? <laughs> Which is a hell of an opening line. It's not like when Stanley Kubrick used to call Stephen King late at night and ask him, like, Do you believe in God? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Friedkin, from his book, is quoted as saying, she was considered a very good actress. She was in the last picture show. But I, frankly, didn't remember which role she played, and I tended to confuse her with Cloris Leachman. In other words, Friedkin was not impressed with his future leading lady. <laughs> what a horrible thing to say after the fact. <laughs> Ellen Burstyn told him that she'd had a strong Catholic upbringing as a girl, but she also left the church after a bad experience. Any any further information on the bad experience? Yeah, I think it was a. Yeah, you think it was a. You think it was a priest? Yeah. Uh. But freaking liked her and started floating her to Warner's. But the studio's head, Ted Ashley, was adamantly opposed. At one point, acting out the phrase "over my dead body" to Friedkin in his office. This is my favorite anecdote from this episode. You take it. <laughs> so. Warner's studio head Ted Ashley uh, literally he was yelling at Freakin about casting Ellen Burst and he said over my dead body that's how this will happen and he laid down in his office in front of the door and was like go ahead try to leave walk over my dead body and Billy Freakin dutifully tries to and Ted Ashley reaches up and grabs his leg and he says this is what will happen if you cast Burstyn I'll come back from the dead and stop you 
<laughs> anyway, she got the part. <laughs> That's up there with what was the the Scott Rudin the the guy that was working with Scott Rudin who eventually just started building pillow forts to hide in when Scott right, Rudin would yeah. yell at him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh God, yeah. Hollywood is run by children. <laughs> Such powerful, rich children, spoiled children. Yes. We're gonna take a quick break, but we'll be right back with more. Too much information in just a moment. Uh, the other roles in the film came fairly easy. William Peter Blatty showed Friedkin a picture of the priest who inspired the character of Father Marin, and Friedkin immediately was inspired to write to Max von Sydow, who accepted the role. Although apparently the studio wanted Marlon Brando, which just would have been all kinds of... I think the reason I heard that Friedkin said no was that it, it would turn this movie into a Brando movie, and that's not yeah. what this is. Yeah. Uh, the power of Christ compels you. Well, I, yeah, he's not into fat Brando phase at that point, yeah. but it's, it would have been funny if he had been. This looks like compels you. The point of the, the devil's doing this, and I just not believe. It's completely, completely half-assing it, like eating out of a bag of Doritos. <laughs> Karas. <laughs> when was the last time you think Brando gave a damn? Oh, Superman? No, yes, before <laughs> Superman. I don't know, because it was gone by Apocalypse. Now they, oh, they said yeah. he was he was Co- the Coppola light was, was out. Horrified when he showed up, like so fat, because <laughs> Kurtz is supposed to be this huge badass who like made it through the Marine training at like the age of forty, and he's like, and now I have this bag of skin <laughs> who showed up. I <laughs> uh, get in the dark. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> like, oi. Uh, Freakin and Blatty were seeing a play scouting an actor for a role, and instead they saw actor Lee J. Cobb, who was best known for originating the role of Willie Loman in Arthur Miller's mm-hmm. Death of a Salesman, as well as roles in 12 Angry Men and On the Waterfront. And he wasn't on stage. He was just in the audience. <laughs> so that's right. a nice bit of s- synchronicity <laughs> there. I wonder if that actor ever found out that he was... Uh... <laughs> He was being scouted for the exorcist and instead they saw the audience was more impressive. Yeah. A more famous actor in the audience. We're like, Oh (laughs) fuck this guy. (laughs) Did you see anything about who it was? I didn't know. (laughs) Uh, Max Macedo was a champ and his performance is obviously amazing, but he was so unnerved by hearing some of the horrifying things coming out of 12 year old Linda Blair's mouth that he forgot his own lines at one point, which is, Understandable. understandable yeah and yeah. she did every, that's the craziest thing about this to me is that she read all that stuff obviously like and gave her own performance that was dubbed over so it was actually a, you in all of the thing where you're like oh yeah mercedes mccambridge blah 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 but then you're like oh yeah 12 13 year old linda blair actually said all that awful stuff <laughs> um and it's you know i thought like oh yeah 1973 i'm sure a lot of that's pretty tame by, you know, nope. today's standards. Oh, no. <laughs> sure isn't. Oh, my. <laughs> what an excellent day for an exorcism. Well, then, let's introduce ourselves. I'm Damien Karras. And I'm the devil. Now, kindly undo these straps. If you're the devil, why not make the straps disappear? That's much too vulgar display of power, Karras. Your mother's in here with us, Karras. Would you like to leave a message? I'll see that she gets it. How long are you planning to stay in Reagan? Until she rots and I stinking in the earth. Uh, casting Reagan, speaking of her, was much harder and took four months. Uh, over a thousand girls aged wow. 11 to 13 sent in tapes. And production was despairing that uh, they'd ever find a girl of Reagan's age who could anchor the film. Uh, and they were about to start looking at teen actresses who simply looked younger. I'd read that they were actually considering uh, uh, people with dwarfism who were adults as well. My favorite bit of this that I had no idea about was um, that uh, Jamie Lee Curtis was going to audition for this. Um, <laughs> and this, she said this in 2018. Uh, and her mother, Janet Lee, of Psycho fame, said no. <laughs> Other folks who were up for consideration were Eve Plum, who played Jan Brady on The Brady Bunch. She apparently auditioned for the role of Reagan McNeil. 
Dana Plato of Silver Spoons fame claims that she auditioned, although Blatty said he had no memory of this and thinks she made it up. <laughs> My favorite almost cast was Debbie Reynolds and her real-life daughter, Carrie Fisher, who would have been perfect. She looks just like... When you look at um, Carrie Fisher in uh, Shampoo when she was like 15 because it was filmed a couple years later, she looks just like Linda Blair. Oh, yeah, she does. Yeah, she has that same kind yeah. of little chubby cheeks, cute, cute little face. Uh, and probably uh, was also already doing cocaine. Uh, also, Denise Nickerson, who played Violet Beauregard and Willy Wonka in The Chocolate Factory, uh, was encouraged to audition, but was discouraged from doing so by her family, who found the story too dark. <laughs> Which is impressive, considering the movie she starred in was about a chocolate tycoon killing children. Yeah, luring children into saw traps. <laughs> uh, but one day, at Freakin's office, which was hilariously at 666 Fifth Avenue, uh, a woman named Eleanor Blair simply showed up asking if he would consider her daughter Linda for the role. Uh, Blair's mom, Eleanor, has a cameo in the film as a nurse. Linda Blair, in Freakin's words, was smart but not precocious, cute but not beautiful, a normal, happy 12-year-old girl. She had done some modeling but hadn't been in a film prior, and her main interest at the time was horses, which is so adorable. Aww. Uh, Freakin writes that when he asked her what she knew about her character in the book, she responded, well, she pushes a man out of her bedroom window and she hits her mother across the face and she masturbates with a crucifix. And then Freakin, I don't know why his mind went here, but he said, well, he said, he said, do you know what masturbates is? And she says, yes. And then he says, have you done it? And she goes, sure. Haven't you? And he was like, that was when the light went off in my head, that I knew she would be able to handle all this stuff. Uh, and then um, I, the, the fact that she hit it off with Burston was also a plus. But that's That's weird. our demon! <laughs> that's a weird thing, I think, to ask a 12-year-old girl. I have bad news. Uh-oh. In uh, August of 2021, 666 Fifth Avenue was renamed 660 Fifth Avenue. F***ers. Because I, I remember know. seeing that sign coming out of the subway at one point. Yeah, I forget what subway stop it was. That's rude of them. That, it's I an know. icon. It's a landmark. Uh, I like the fact that Linda Blair's own agency didn't think to recommend her for the part in The Exorcist. Uh, her agent sent along 30 young actresses, but not Linda. <laughs> if her mom hadn't stepped in, she wouldn't have snagged the part. So hopefully she got new representation after that. Yeah, right? Wow. Um, two other women helped bring Reagan to life. Uh, Warners forced Friedkin to use a woman named Eileen Dietz, who was 15 years uh, Blair's senior, as Blair's stunt double. She stands in for the crucifix scene, the fist fight with Father Karras, and others that were deemed just too extreme for Blair. And she also appears as the face of Pazuzu. No? Too much for you? I hate that. Those little one shot yeah. interstitial bits with the oh it's like a it's like a mime from hell. I hate that so that much. That was what the makeup was originally going to be. That was the first design that they rejected. Um for for Reagan? Yeah, as possessed. Oh. Um and uh Dietz was angry that her contribution to the film had been minimized. And she would later claim in the press that she'd performed all the possession scenes. And then Warners counted her by tallying up her her screen time at just over 28 seconds, which feels unnecessarily cruel. We'll talk about Eileen uh, Dietz later. But then now I want to talk about Mercedes McCambridge. She provided the speaking voice of the possessed Reagan. One of the it's on the Mount Rushmore voice performances, man. I mean, she is so scary and what is that voice it literally like if you were like what what sounds like it comes from the depths of hell i would say that voice a gender uh, yeah. I, I have no idea what age it yes. is it's just yeah yeah i can't even do like i can't get as low as she does that's it sounds like tom waits dude it's so fucking <laughs> crazy um she and it was even more nuts she had already had a full career by the time she got to this she worked extensively with orson wells during his radio era he once called her the world's greatest living radio actress which is a pretty Whoa. great compliment from Orson Welles, yeah. Sadly, she was not in his infamous War of the Worlds radio play, but she was in some great ones. And by 1949, she won an Oscar for All, All the King's Men. Um, and then she also acted opposite Joan Crawford in Johnny Guitar, uh, against Elizabeth Taylor in Giant. 
Wow. And she has a memorable cameo menacing Janet Lee in Orson Welles' Touch of Evil, also infamously known as the film that uh, Duke Ellington did an amazing score for, and the film that has Charlton Heston in brownface as a Mexican guy. <laughs> anyway, Freakin's first choice for the role was another voice actor named Ken Nordine, who I know through my beloved Tom Waits. Tom Waits described him as an early influence on his kind of beat jazz uh what I think is the shitty era of Tom Waits is like <laughs> sort of uh, Billy Joel with a worse drinking problem era where he was doing like lounge jazz piano and then like beat poetry inspired stuff over the top. Uh, Nordine uh, would just improvise or recite poetry over like a jazz combo um, and he called it word jazz, <laughs> which is what I call my writing. <laughs> Um, but he couldn't summon a sufficiently demonic voice. And so Friedkin turned to McCambridge and she was performing at a Dallas stage production of who's afraid of Virginia Wolf. She watched a rough cut of the film with Blair reading the lines. And then she told Friedkin that she was a recovering alcoholic and deeply Catholic. And she cited the religion as helping her get through the addiction. She was a really early public advocate for alcoholism treatment. Um, she actually had to leave AA because she was no longer anonymous, because she went uh, before a Senate subcommittee testifying about alcoholism and addiction in 1969. McCambridge added that she wanted to have two priests on set when she or on at, on the soundstage where she was doing the recording um, to help her get through some of this blasphemous dialogue. And she was a smoker for 30 years, but she told Freakin that in order to pull off what she was envisioning as the voice for this, she would have to start drinking again. And that's what she God. did. One of the most famous um, things about this movie that's recited is that she ch she chain smoked, uh, slugged down Jack Daniels, and to get the suitably disgusting sound for the famous projectile vomiting scene, she swallowed eighteen raw eggs and a pulpy apple. Oh, for some reason the pulpy apple is the thing that kicks it yeah, over, right? Um, talking to the New York Times about the experience, she called the role the most difficult performance of my life and a terrible experience. Uh, she delved into her inspiration for the voice, and this is where it gets truly horrifying. The wheezing, for instance, my chronic bronchitis helped with that. I did it on one microphone, then on another, elevating it a bit, then a third and fourth, two tones higher each time, and they combined it as a chorus. <laughs> the wailing just before the demon is driven out that's a sound I once heard at a wake in Ireland. I used moaning cries I'd used when playing Lady Macbeth for Orson. For the groaning sounds, I pulled a scarf around my neck, tight and almost strangled. And this is the thing that really haunts me. She pulled inspiration from some of the screams that the demon made uh, from her experiences drying out in a detox facility remembering the cries of patients going through alcohol withdrawal. And a truly haunting quote, she said, I cried out from my remembered hell. That sounds like something from like, like uh, a Paradise Lost or Dante or something like. I mean, the thing that's even more upsetting for me is that she must have known that she was about to go through that again. Now that she started drinking again yeah. for this performance. That's true. Of, of all the disturbing elements of this film and production, this woman breaking her hard-earned sobriety is maybe the most upsetting to me. Uh, my girlfriend's in the midst of getting her master's to be a therapist, and she's in the middle of uh, taking classes on addiction, and she's mm. been talking to me at length about that. And, I, yeah, I, I mean, I don't think I realize the, the sanctity with which those in recovery hold their sobriety. So that is a truly insane sacrifice. And I, that's got to be one of the darkest elements of the story, I'd say. Yeah. yeah, everybody talking about it just goes into this. Like, they, they always do the, oh, she chain smoked, drank Jack Daniels, and, and um, you know, slugged down eggs. That's like the log line you see in all the shitty BuzzFeed listicles and, you know, whatever. But the, the she really went deep. <laughs> and it took a lot out of her. How long was she sober? Did you, did you know? I don't. I don't. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's also crazy that she was like, she wanted to be such an advocate for getting alcoholism in the public eye in 1969 that she was like, well, I guess I'm not an AA anymore. <laughs> That's mm. nuts, man. Wow.
Uh, William Friedkin, in a 2012 screening Q&A, admitted that he was equally horrified <laughs> by the lengths that she went for this performance. Uh, one detail that often gets cited is that Mercedes McCambridge recorded her lines strapped to a chair to give the impression that the demon was struggling against bonds. Friedkin said, I tied her hands behind her back and she would do the dubbing a line at a time. And often she would ask for more booze and more cigarettes. She'd come off a take and then go to a couch in the back where these two priests were. And she would collapse in their arms and burst into tears. Jesus. <laughs> right? It just gets worse and worse. It wasn't hard for me to imagine the rage. See, if, it, if, if it's this close in me right here... I'm only a human being. It's that close in everybody. Everybody can from this second forward. That isn't hard. Um, now, somewhat predictably, there are two versions of what happened next. Freakin has claimed that McCambridge voluntarily gave up her credit on the film, uh, telling him she didn't want people to think about who did the voice. McCambridge said that he, in fact, promised her a credit, and it was only when she showed up at the screening that she realized she had oh. been omitted from the film's credits. She told the New York Times, it's heartbreaking when someone you thought was a friend does that. Um, Freakin told her that uh, there wasn't time to get her added to the credits. Um, and there's been a persistent conspiracy theory that it was at one point floated by Mercedes McCambridge herself that the detail that she voiced the demon was kept out of the press until Linda Blair had secured a, an Oscar nomination. They let everyone think that Linda Blair did that voice to help her land an Oscar. And then like the day after it came out that she won the nomination, the studios leaked the story to Variety and the trades and said that um, it was a, a, a woman with a career and an Oscar. It wasn't this child in her debut film performance. So really a raw deal for Mercedes. Yeah, it's a pretty sleazy move because once a nomination's given, it can't be revoked. So, I mean, that's a good play. Uh, but on the flip side, there are some people who think that the news that this, you know, professional voice actress with an Oscar to her name uh, actually provided that unforgettable voice uh, might have actually torpedoed Linda Blair's chance for an Oscar win, which, I mean, let's be real, kind of deserved it. You think, Linda, you think she deserved it? I mean, I don't I know. I mean, admittedly, it's... I've never seen Paper Moon, um, but yeah, because the Oscar did go to Tatum O'Neill, uh, who still holds the record as the youngest Oscar winner ever uh, for Paper Moon. But, and I say this with love to uh, Linda Blair, I think her career after this testifies that she maybe wasn't the greatest actress of all time. And that she just... Was she not a great actress, or was she just, like, typecast slash developed she, a drug problem yeah. or other problems. Well, that's then, true. Yeah, and her life was admittedly made it much more insane by this film, but, uh, you know, she didn't... Yeah, I don't know. I, she's great. I mean, she is she is perfect for this. because It's, it's like Freakin said. She's, like, smart, but not obnoxiously so. She doesn't give off, like, Jonathan Lipnicki vibes. She doesn't have, like, <laughs> theater kid vibes, like, like Jacob Tremblay. Um, so, uh, yeah. But I, yeah, I mean, I don't know, man. I, I listen to me shitting on a 12 year old's <laughs> performance in one of the fa most famous films of all time. Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> you can't say I'm not consistent. <laughs> uh, I mean, what I will yeah, say, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna now shit on a 10 year old. Uh, I mean, Tatum O'Neill okay. was acting with her dad in Paper Moon, right? right. O'Neill. So I'm gonna say, you know what? No. <laughs> Should have gone to Linda Blair. Damn it. Yeah. Um, anyway, the whole thing with Mercedes McCambridge went to the Screen Actors Guild, and she got her name reinserted in the credits. Uh, on a related note, this is one of the first movies that didn't use credits after the opening title card. Did you know that? Yeah, I, I think Freakin had some kind of quote about that where he said, like, Citizen Kane is the only good film that had the credits before the action or something like that. Something predictably obnoxious. Let me see if I can find it. <laughs> but go ahead. And speaking <laughs> of titles, 
William Peter Blatty claimed that Warner Brothers wanted to change the title of The Exorcist because none of the studio executives knew what an exorcism was. <laughs> yeah. Which scans. It does, doesn't it? Um, SAG also had to intercede on the behalf of a third woman who played Reagan, uh, stunt woman Ann Miles. Reagan was a trained gymnast, and she performed the spider walk sequence that um, was cut from the original film. Apparently, um, Blatty didn't feel that the contraption that they used to keep her safe was sufficiently removed from the original cut. So he cut it out and put it back in 2000 when they could use CGI to paint over it. Um, It is horrifying. She walks backwards and on all fours down a set of stairs and then vomits up blood. It's one of the worst things I've ever seen. Um... Yeah. Somehow the walking backwards down the stairs was more upsetting than the vomiting blood. Yeah, yeah. It's so you know? uncanny. Yeah. It gives you that like deep sense of like Freudian unease where you're like, that's not how that body works. It should be. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so she uh spent two weeks rehearsing that scene and did it on the first take. Whoa. And then it was cut. Uh so it was reinstated for the 2000 re-release. Uh, and she wasn't again, was not credited. Although she'd been telling people, she did an interview where she said she'd been telling people that she had done that stunt for years. And it, the fact that she wasn't credited ended up damaging her credibility to it and costing her work. And so SAG Whoa. once again intervened and got her name added. That scene is so infamous to me because I, for me, it ranks up there with the head rotation pea soup thing. I thought it was in the original. Maybe I just remember seeing it from like trailers and stuff for the reissue or the re-release. But yeah, I mean, that's like, that's for me the thing that really stays with you. Yeah. Oh, oh, I don't even like, I don't like thinking. No, No, we're done. Moving on. Um, Production on The Exorcist was split between Washington, D.C. for exteriors and sound stages in New York for the interiors at the McNeil home. The various hospital settings are in New York as well. Uh, Bellevue. One was shot at Fordham in Bronx. Um, But despite this, the film has become known as something of a love letter to Georgetown. Multiple scenes are shot at the university. Jason Miller spent a week on campus studying the Jesuits there to prepare for his role. And um, they actually got some on-set visits from uh, Father Thomas King, who is a professor of theology at Georgetown, to bless the set after some of the accidents. Um, (laughs) Around 300 Georgetown students, staff, and faculty, including Jesuits, appear as extras in the movie earning salaries from $35 to $128 per day, while Warners paid the university's standard $1,000 a day to film there. Blatty was so deeply Catholic and so concerned about his alma mater's spiritual soul that he started a petition to the Vatican that made it all the way to the Vatican's highest court, seeking the enforcement of canon law to reform Georgetown University, which he felt had strayed away from its founding principles. It was still ongoing at the time of his death in 2017. I don't know what this says about fate or God or what, but it was during production that Blatty met his future wife, Linda Trero, who was a tennis pro who'd been hired as an extra on the set at Georgetown. Aw. What do you think about that? But yeah, right? To, we will get to a better marriage that came from this film later. Yes. Uh, Exteriors for the McNeil's home, including the iconic shot of Marin under the streetlight, probably top five iconic film stills of all time, possibly. Uh, Those were shot at 3600 Prospect Street. Uh, Friedkin would say that he considered shooting inside of Senator and later Treasury Secretary Lloyd Benson's house in D.C. Benson asked for one million (laughs) dollars. (laughs) <laughs> Which is, I guess, what something the Treasury Secretary would do. That's like almost ten million now. <laughs> so is that is that basically a no? Like, yeah, you can. I, yeah, for, probably. Like, is that what that is? <laughs> uh, the woman who owned the house that they did eventually shoot at, Mrs. Florence Mahoney, didn't want her plants to die during production, so the crew had to construct special sets when filming the exteriors so they didn't block the light. <laughs> I love, love a that. plant mom. Yeah. Uh, the famous exorcist steps, by the way, which were, they were originally built in 1895, which have you ever been there? It explains why they're yeah. so damn treacherous looking. They mm-hmm. are steep. They were built during the construction of uh, a storage structure for cable cars as sort of a um, priority path for workers. They had been referred to as the 
Hitchcock steps, uh, Friedkin said, a, a reference to Alfred Hitchcock's 1935 thriller, The 39 Steps, although I think there are 70-something exorcist steps. Um, they required a bit of a cheat to appear as they do in the film. They added an extension to 3600 Prospect Street to allow Karras to fall properly. Otherwise, the, the, the property was set too far back from the steps to make it believable. And then, obviously, they were also padded with, like, a half inch of rubber for the poor guy who had to fall all the <laughs> way down the damn things. <laughs> and, and in an incredible bit of capitalism, Georgetown reportedly charged students $5 admission to watch the stunt of this guy falling down the stairs from nearby rooftops. <laughs> and even more hilariously to me, Blatty said that that fall, he wrote the fall into his novel because he was uh, there was an incident that he remembered from being a student where one of his physics classmates was hospitalized after falling down a flight of stairs, fleeing after attempting to steal... <laughs> final exam <laughs> uh, the steps were recognized as a DC landmark in 2015 and a plaque at their base commemorates them I have a question go on when you said that they were known as the Hitchcock steps was that because they look like the steps from the 39 steps or was did he did Hitchcock film that there I have no idea I don't know I don't oh. 39 steps is one of my blank spots for for Hitchcock um, maybe it was just they were like ah steps Right, yeah. <laughs> Staircase. Um, and, of course, production also shot in Mosul, Iraq for three months for the film's opening. Uh, in his interview to 2006 Oscar screening, Freakin said that because America did not have diplomatic relations with Iraq at the time, he dealt directly with the ruling Ba'ath Party, who agreed to production on the condition that he, A, hire a large number of Iraqi crew members, B, teach them how to create makeup blood, and C, <laughs> donate a print of the French connection. Freakin told the Hollywood reporter, I remember the head of Warner's Ted Ashley saying, if you go over there and you get killed, it's your own fault. They didn't, but it wasn't for lack of trying. Uh, <laughs> temp temperatures reached 130 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, limiting their shooting window to dawn or dusk. And this was particularly hard on Max von Sydow, who was wearing Dick Smith's extensive and impressive old age makeup. He would remove it after shooting and sweat trapped between his skin and the latex appliances would pour off his skin like a river. Oh yeah. There's a disgusting mental image for you. Someone yeah. pulling off a bunch of latex old age appliances and sweat dripping out of it. Ugh. Uh, yet another problem with the Iraq shoot was that the massive statue of Pazuzu was accidentally sent to Hong Kong at first and not Iraq. So fun fact about um, the, the the name of the demon Pazuzu, uh, it is not actually mentioned in the first movie. Uh, it, it's only actually mentioned um, in uh, the second movie, which is famously one of the most dog shit movies ever made. It is truly awful, despite having both Blair return, James Earl Jones, Richard Burton, and uh, Nurse Ratched herself. Uh, oh, Louise Fletcher, yeah. Yes, yes, and it is stunningly, stunningly dog I really... Who directed that? John Borman? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, but yes, that is the film in which the demon says, I am Pazuzu. Uh, so... <laughs> I mean, that's kind of... Uh, the name... It's, it's funny. It's a little... Yeah. Yeah. It it's is. not the most phonetically threatening name you could come up with. No. <laughs> uh, What's well, a good, like, something or... Like, in, in, I think an or is threatening. Yeah. Yeah. Or Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> Gary. I am Gary the demon. I, I am Gary. <laughs> <laughs> I had a whole bit in college. I just, because, you know, you, there are plenty of people named Gary, but I've never seen a baby named Gary. Like, can you imagine a baby named Gary? I don't so like I had a whole, it. No, I had yeah. a whole sketch that was just Baby Gary. He's just born with a with a five o'clock shadow and a bad back, and worried about you know refinancing his house. Yeah, and, yeah, no it tracks. He's got to yeah. get his boat siding replaced. <laughs> <laughs> well, one problem that Friedkin didn't have was with the Catholic Church, which is surprising to me. 
Freakin said at the aforementioned Q&A that, quote, most of the people at the highest levels of the church accepted the film totally because the Roman ritual of exorcism is still in the New Testament, adding that church officials later told him they credited the film for inspiring a flood of applications to convents and seminaries. I mean, it is actually a deeply conservative film in a sense yeah. because it's, you know, the Catholic Catholicism wins and solves what science could not. <laughs> like, you see how the church would have been like, oh, yeah, we count this one as a W. Did it win? Well, it won for Reagan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It won the battle. Lost the I, war. Lo- yeah. Yeah. Uh, on the plus side for the Catholic Church, two real life priests appear in the film. One of them was a priest from Buffalo, New York, named Father William O'Malley, who once gave William Peter Blatty grief about the characterization of Father Karras in his novel. He was cast as Karras' mentor, Father Joseph Dyer, who I believe is the guy who comes up to his body after it's thrown down the stairs at the end and gives him last absolution. Yes, 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 yes. yes. And we'll talk about Uh, that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Also, the Jesuit Reverend Thomas Birmingham appears as the president of Georgetown. William Friedkin later said the Cardinal of New York preached about the exorcist from the pulpit and said great things about it. The guy who was the head of the Jesuit order at the time, Father Pedro Arupe, who was headquartered in Milan, he had his own print of it and would show it to his fellow priests and bishops and cardinals. I I mean, I get it, but I just have a hard time, especially with with, with the crucifix shot. Well, uh, yeah. Imagining these priests would watch that. Yeah, yeah. You know, they they were they were having a tough time in the 70s. They needed a win. Yeah. There was Maybe the Beatles, squint. Rosemary's Baby, you know, um, Pot. Uh, <laughs> Led Zeppelin. Yeah, they needed a win. <laughs> <laughs> Still, there were dissenters about The Exorcist. Freakin would add, the Cardinal in Boston loathed it and wanted it banned, as Cardinals in Boston often do. Billy Graham, who was not Catholic, it deserves to be said, denounced it from the pulpit and said, the devil is in every frame of this film. You know you're doing well if Billy Graham name drops you. Yeah, comes for you. So, now we have to get to the other most famous thing about The Exorcist, which is the alleged curse. It was a cursed film. I thought you froze again. What am I doing? Curse! Curse. Oh, man, froze again. (laughs) Um, Yeah, and in fairness, there was an admittedly tremendous run of bad luck that befell production, and we'll list them in order of severity. Uh, As we mentioned, the statue of Pazuzu was lost in transit to Iraq, which delayed production there for three or four weeks. Half the 18-person crew in, in Iraq were replaced at one point or another due to either dysentery or sunstroke. Which would you prefer? Ooh. I think dysentery. Yeah, it's just a cleanse. Yeah. You know, you're I, just, could lo- I could afford to lose some weight. Yeah. I'll go with dysentery. Yeah, you're yeah. just scooped out for for a couple of days. You're not like it's like a colonic. <laughs> it's like a free colonic. <laughs> most famously, a fire at Fox Studios in New York on West Fifty Fourth destroyed most of the interior sets when only an NYC baby, greatest <laughs> city in the world, Bing Bong, a pigeon flew into a circuit box. <laughs> Causing, Sky rats <laughs> causing a six week delay. However, and six weeks, six weeks, man. This film filmed for over a year. God. However, and this is the spookiest part. <laughs> I think it's turning into Dracula now. Uh, the set for Reagan's room was untouched. Wow. That is. Walking on broken glass. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just have poor pitch. Um, uh, according to Possessed, the true story of an exorcism by Thomas B. Allen, Freakin asked one of the film's consultants, the aforementioned Father Birmingham, to perform an exorcism on the set. But because in Catholicism there are actually very strict things you have to go through for exorcism, Birmingham said, A, this didn't qualify, and B, would probably just freak everyone out more. Uh, so he blessed it instead. And also a spooky part. Birmingham told Alan, nothing else happened on the set after the ritual, but around that time, there was a fire in the Jesuit residence in Georgetown. 
um, or the set for it. Spooky! Ellen Burstyn <laughs> actually suffered a permanent injury to her back, but not because of anything supernatural, because Billy Friedkin was a dickhead. She was performing the scene where she gets yanked back and slammed against the wall uh, by a possessed Reagan, and, um, you know, they did that in the old-fashioned way, where they just put some wires on you and pulled real hard, and she told, she asked Freakin, like, you know, he's hurting me, can you tell him to stop, and Freakin said no, and... Do it harder. Yeah, well, uh, to hear Ellen Burstyn tell it, she either saw or felt a uh, Freakin gesture behind her back to the stunt guy to not tone it down or to pull harder. And so the guy did. He slammed her against the wall and she fell on the floor. Uh, and that is her real scream of pain. That is the final take that appears in the film. And uh, she permanently injured her back. Linda Blair was also permanently injured uh, by a similar effect. Um, she's in a, a, a wire harness being thrown up and down for that shot. Uh, and she was screaming in pain while she was shooting, but everyone thought she was just in character. Uh, the incident fractured part of her lower spine and resulted in lifelong scoliosis. Wow. Other people were minorly maimed. A crew member lost his toe. Uh, oh. a, a carpenter chopped off his thumb. Uh, that was in a, in a fanzine called Castle Frankenstein that director Joe Dante actually wrote for at one point. Um, Jason Miller's son, Jason, who himself was an actor and maybe best known for his role in The Lost Boys, was critically injured during the filming when he was struck by a motorcyclist on a beach. Was Jason's son in this movie? No, uh, but Jason Patrick is the kid's name, and he's gone on to be in quite a, quite a bit of stuff. Uh, Wait, he's the one who broke uh, Julia Roberts' heart. They were engaged, and then they broke up right before she... No, that was Kiefer Sutherland. Oh, right, right. Different she lost got boy. her revenge on Kiefer Sutherland by by having an affair afterwards with, with Jason Patrick. You're right. Uh, <laughs> so many lost boys, so little time. And now, the deaths. In a documentary about the film, Ellen Burstyn recalled that an astounding nine people died during the making of the film. Uh, she quoted an assistant cameraman whose wife had a uh, baby during the shoot. The baby either died or was stillborn. She said the man who refrigerated the set died. Uh, the night watchman died. The aforementioned Vasiliki Mariaros, who played the father of Father Car who played the mother of Father Karras, excuse me. Uh, she passed away during production in February 1973 at the age of 89, admittedly. While Jack McGowan, who is an an Irish actor who specialized in Beckett, he was one of the foremost uh, stars of Beckett's plays. Uh, he uh -huh. played the drunk director, Burke Dennings. He finished filming, went back to London, and died as a result of the flu epidemic that had broken out there. On his first day that he arrived in the States to film, Max von Sydow received word that his brother had unexpectedly died in Sweden, and he had to return home, which further delayed shooting. Linda Blair's grandfather also died during the shoot. This curse persisted after alleged curse persisted after filming wrapped. This is pretty crazy. I do have to admit the studio chose a theater across the street from a 16th century church in Rome for the premiere of the film in Italy. And as it happened, a thunderstorm was occurring that night. The church was struck by such a powerful blow of lightning that the cross on top of the spire broke off and fell into the plaza below, which really must have freaked everybody out. I have to say. And then also in 2015, Hatra, which was a designated World Heritage site where the prologue was shot, was damaged by uh, militants from ISIS. Now. It gets worse. It gets but worse. Wait, there's more. Yeah. So one of the most famous scenes in the film, and honestly, the one that I have the most trouble watching. Yes. Um, yes. Is this is what supposedly caused people to run out of the theater and puke or or faint? Um, oh. This is the scene in which Reagan undergoes a procedure called a cerebral angiography, and that was a, it's a now archaic. You okay, buddy? Yeah, yeah. I'm just <laughs> just 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 white knuckling through this description. Yeah. So it is a now archaic uh, medical procedure in which a patient's carotid artery uh, from the front of the neck was punctured in order to insert a catheter during which a contrast agent was injected to make the patient's blood vessels more visible under x-rays. They did it to the carotid because it was the fastest and most powerful uh, way that the this coloring agent would circulate through the body. But it is gross. Um, mm -hmm. 
it is a not an artery you want punctured, generally speaking. I'm not a doctor, but I do know that. <laughs> um, Freakin just happened upon it while he was visiting NYU. Uh, he was researching these different medical procedures that would be portrayed in the film, and the doctor who arranged the visit recommended that he witness this procedure performed by a tech named Paul Bateson. Freakin was so impressed uh, with Bateson's deft hand with the procedure, and especially with young children, that he cast Bateson in the film. And that scene of The Exorcist is now one of the only places where you can see this footage of this procedure being performed because it's no longer done. Um, and it's become famous in medical circles for this accuracy. Now, that's not where Bateson's story ends. Bateson was a lifelong alcoholic. Uh, he dipped in and out of sobriety and was a patron of the... He was also a gay man and was a patron and frequenter of the West Village's gay bars in particular leather clubs like the Mineshaft. But it was at a Christopher Street bar called the Badlands that he met Addison Verrill, who was a reporter for Variety at the time. The two ended up drinking all night, doing drugs. They went back to Verrill's apartment and had sex. And then Verrill ended up being murdered. A friend of Verrill's was a gay activist and journalist named Arthur Bell, and he wrote an article about Verrill's murder in the Village Voice, contextualizing it within the larger epidemic of violence and murders uh, that were happening to gay men in the West Village and the NYPD's seeming refusal or inability to do anything about it. The article ended with Bell's phone number. Uh, it's kind of an insane thing to do for a journalist. You would not get away with that today. Self-doxing. Yeah, and Bateson called him. Uh, he didn't identify himself by name, but he had a number of details about the murder that were not released to the public. While waiting for Bateson to call back, Bell and the NYPD who were there received another call um, this time from a guy who said he knew Bateson from a detox program. This guy said that Bateson also called him to confess. So they arrested him, and long story short, he ended up serving a little over 24 years for the murder. He is believed to have died in 2021. It gets weirder because freaking visited him in jail, Bateson, and spoke with him about a series of serial killings of gay men that the NYPD believed Bateson may have been connected to. These were called the bag murders because they, the, the victims were dismembered and uh, placed in the Hudson River in bags, and they had markings on them indicating that they had come from the NYU Medical Center's neuropsychiatric unit. Bateson told Freakin that the NYPD was pressuring him to confess to these murders in exchange for a reduced sentence. He was never conclusively linked to them. Anyway, this whole thing then spurred Freakin to adapt New York Times reporter Gerald Walker's 1970 novel Cruising about a police officer going undercover in the gay community to catch a serial killer. That film stars a hilariously too old for the role Al Pacino um, and features scenes that were set at uh, the gay club Hellfire that was redecorated to uh, resemble the mine shaft. And it came out in 1980 to widespread protests from the gay community, although it has since been uh, reclassified as something of a cult classic. Ooh, what is the mine shaft? It's a leather club. Oh, yeah. There's a scene in Cruising uh, in which a, a, a large black man strides into the interrogation room dressed in nothing but a jock strap and a cowboy hat and slaps someone across the face and then walks out. It is never explained or addressed further. Sounds like my first day at People. <laughs> hey, you're still under an NDA. You can't talk about that. <laughs> uh, we make jokes to try to lighten this yeah, to keep but it only crying. gets darker yeah uh lastly and perhaps most horribly the voice of the demon mercedes mccambridge suffered an unimaginable loss in 1989 when her son john markle who'd committed assorted crimes at his investment firm killed his wife christine and their two daughters amy and suzanne and then himself in their little rock home he supposedly wore a Halloween-style mask to commit the murders. Do you mean like a, a Michael Myers No, I think just like or... a dime store Halloween mask. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, wore a Halloween-style mask to commit these murders and left a fairly cruel note to McCambridge that, although it absolved her of any wrongdoing in his financial crimes, basically accused her of being an absentee mother. I think you can read the text on her Wikipedia page. 
it is not nice. Yeah, don't don't investigate that yeah. further. Yeah, no, you really don't want to. Uh, of course, at least some of the misery on the set of The Exorcist could be chalked up to the film's production schedule. Principal photography went from the scheduled 85 days to more than 200, meaning that the movie went $2.5 million or $12.5 million today over budget. They'd lost somewhere in the neighborhood of about four months of shooting time owing to various delays, so they were behind schedule and rushing. This, coupled with the fact that interiors were shot primarily with available light, as opposed to being professionally lit, I think I saw something about how Friedkin wanted the kitchen to be all like stainless steel appliances and yeah. shiny surfaces. And the, the cinematographer light, like, was like, can't light this. He was like, yeah, what an imag- unimaginable pain in the ass that was. <laughs> it's like lighting this consisted of flicking the switch on the ceiling light and just going for it. Um, so these sets were dim and consequently accident prone which is uh, not exactly a combination for an injury-free set, as you say. Then, of course, there is good old Billy Friedkin, who could be a tremendous bastard. Aside from the aforementioned situation with Burston, in which she broke her coccyx, I believe, was the, was the outcome of that, of the back injury? Yeah. Uh, Friedkin combined an exacting and exhaustive approach to filming with downright awful behavior. <laughs> He also, I love this, denied the extent of Ellen Burson's injuries in a 2018 interview saying, I'm sure she was hurt by the fall. You fall on your backside, it's going to hurt. But she wasn't injured. As my father's high school football coach would say, is it pain or is it injury? (laughs) Jesus. Pennsylvania high school football, my friends. So here's some tales of Freakin's particular brand of horse on the set of Exorcist, as recounted in the legendary uh, tome on 70s Mm. Hollywood, Easy Riders, Raging Bulls, absolutely a must-read for anybody interested in this era of cinema. Some or all of what you're about to hear would earn William Friedkin the nickname Wacky (laughs) Willie from his crew. So uh, uh, deeply downplaying the depths of (laughs) this. He fired John Robert Lloyd, a production designer who'd worked with him on several films, the day before principal photography was set to begin, which delayed things six weeks. He had his director's chair stenciled with an Oscar for the French connection next to his name. He delayed shooting while he sent his prop master in search of preservative-free bacon because he didn't like the way the bacon in a particular shot was curling. He worked so methodically that one crew member reported coming back from three days of sick leave to find Freakins still shooting the same shot. He would fire people in the morning and rehire them by afternoon. One crew member recounted that Freakin had a smiling conversation and a handshake with a guy and then walked past him and said, get this guy out of here. (coughs) Slapped William O'Malley, the aforementioned real life priest playing Father Dyer across the face before a take to get a suitably emotional line reading from him. Though he did at least have the courtesy to ask him, do you trust him, before he struck him in the face. And that was right before he was giving final absolution to Father Karras after he got thrown out the window. And it was after like 15 takes. Because freaking was berating him and was like, you're not giving me enough. And, and William O'Malley was like, I've just given my best friend the last rites 15 times. Like, what do you want from me? And freaking says, do you trust me? And then slapped him across <laughs> the face and asked him to roll again. Um, freaking once got drunk and attempted to do the tablecloth out from under the dishes trick on an enormous spread that craft service had set out for Christmas and failed, sending everything to the floor. <laughs> he would play tapes of anything from South American tree frogs to the soundtrack of Psycho at high volume on the set to unnerve his actors. Perhaps most famously, he not only carried his own pistol on the set and fired it off frequently, but he'd also have his prop director randomly fire blanks from a shotgun to keep the actors in a state of fear and high alert. In an interview, Jason Miller recalled one of the arguments he got in with Freakin happened after the director fired a gun near his ear to get an authentic reaction from him just before a take. He threw a reel uh, with music from Lalo Schifrin, one of the film's original composers, across the street into a parking lot while in post-production saying, that's where that f***ing marimba music belongs. Uh, As per an interview with Eileen Dietz, who is Blair's stunt double for Reagan, Freakin wanted the smell of the demon to be rancid, so he did this thing during the possession sequences where he would hide old hamburger meat and rotten eggs on the set so it would make the actors feel uncomfortable. 
The problem was that the cast and crew all got sick, so we had to stop shooting. There was a whole discussion between Dietz and Freakin about the masturbation scene, where they argued over the correct way to mime masturbation. With a crucifix. Yes. I just love Billy, William Freakin. was like, no, trust me, I know how to do this better than you. <laughs> and she was like, I beg to differ. <sighs> As you meditate on that, we'll be right back with more Too Much Information after these messages. And then, of course, there's the whole refrigerated set situation, which we kind of touched on in our Thing episode. Cinematographer Owen Reutzman explained in an interview with the American Society of Cinematographers that the set for Reagan's bedroom was duplicated and built inside a larger insulated structure and then refrigerated down to, tell him, Heigl, 20 degrees below zero. Duh! Because they wanted both the effect of seeing the actor's breath and, of course, they wanted to make the actors genuinely uncomfortable. As if the slapping, the gunshots, the psychological warfare style music being played at loud volumes and the raw food wasn't enough. <sighs> and, and presumably verbal abuse at every corner as well, right. I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we tried it at first just below freezing, about 25 degrees, and you could see some breath, but it really wasn't enough. And as soon as the lights were turned on, the heat took care of the cold so quickly that it didn't even make a take. We found out during the test period that this wouldn't work, so we went back to the drawing board. A system was developed that could refrigerate the room quickly to any temperature from 0 to 20 below. The breath showed up fine at 0, but Freakin wanted the actors to really feel cold because he felt that would help their acting. An actor on their knees for 15 minutes at 20 below zero is really going to feel cold. It worked out very well. It worked out very well for the performances, but the refrigeration system, which they adopted from a restaurant air conditioning unit and would leave on overnight to chill the room before the actors arrived, cost $50,000 or almost half a million dollars today and broke down constantly. And also, the lighting they used would warm the room, so they could only complete about five shots a day, <laughs> which slowed things down. All told, the exorcism scene, which was filmed entirely in sequence, took nearly a month to shoot. A month in... A month. Under 20 degrees. In hell. Yeah, yeah. A month in hell. <laughs> R- raw, rotting food. Oh. <laughs> But wait, oh, my favorite anecdote about the whole refrigeration scene. Apparently, there was a layer of moisture in the set one day, which resulted in a thin layer of snow. It started to snow in the bedroom set. I just, I love contrasting this with the 130 degree temperatures on location in Iraq. And Max von Sydow was there for both. Like poor, <laughs> sweet Max von Sydow, just a gentle, mourning his brother. Gentlemanly Swede in mourning, literally going from one temperature extreme to the other. While a small child is screaming profanities and obscenities at him. So there's all that. Uh, yeah. On to a more fun production note, though. Uh, iconic makeup artist Dick Smith, who ultimately quit the films three times over working with Freakin. Uh, he designed the old age makeup for Max von Sydow, and that was Dick Smith's specialty. He's basically held up as one of the pioneers of this particular subgenre of uh, makeup effects. Yeah, I didn't realize that Max von Sydow in this movie was only, I think, 44. You're not alone in that. Everyone was like, when they saw him without the makeup, they were like, he's not that old? Uh, it took four hours to apply, and Pauline Kale, the dean of American film critics, singled it out in her otherwise not particularly positive review in The New Yorker. Um, Smith's old age <laughs> makeup method was something of a revolution in the film industry. He used multiple latex appliances in overlapping pieces instead of uh, just a one piece mask, which had kind of been they would just slap something on and be like, yeah, you're old now. Um, and this was an innovation that allowed actors to actually act. That allowed them to access the full range of their facial expressions. Um, prior to The Exorcist, this was uh, most famously seen in Little Big Man uh, for Dustin Hoffman's oh, character yeah. in 1970, which aged Hoffman to 121 years old. Um, he, Dick Smith was also similarly remembered for aging Marlon Brando in The Godfather and F. Murray Abraham in Amadeus, for which he received an Oscar, because as dutiful listeners will recall, the Oscars only instituted an award for makeup in 1981. 
for your beloved Rick Baker. Yes. For his work on An American Werewolf in London. Uh, though there was a special achievement award for makeup in 1968 for Planet of the Apes. What do you think prompted this, uh, the, the best makeup category got added full time in 81? I mean, it had to be. It might have been an American Werewolf in London, I guess. Yeah, because Thing wasn't until 82, so they hadn't truly mm-hmm. seen what that could do. Yeah, it might have been that, honestly. They were just like, this is so insane. New category. <laughs> Also, your beloved Rick Baker, who worked on a lot of John Carpenter movies, including The Thing, served as Dick Smith's makeup assistant for The Exorcist. I think this was the first time they worked together. He wrote him a letter because he read uh, Dick Smith had a makeup book that came out and, and Rick Baker wrote him a letter. and was like, you're my hero. And Dick, and Dick Smith and his infinite generosity was like, come work for me. <laughs> Smith was also responsible for the demonic makeup, not just on Linda Blair, but on Blair's stunt double. Uh, the aforementioned uh, woman whose ghoulish white makeup appears as single frame inserts in the film. That was the original God. look. You hate it so much. I love it. I, I think it. it's kind of goofy and quaint. I don't like the teeth. No. Uh, that was the original look that Smith concocted for Blair, but then Freakin recalled it a Q&A. Why don't we try and do what looks like she scarred herself and these sores will just progressively get worse and worse. Smith did a lot of research on gangrenous wounds and burn victims. And he brought me a lot of actual photos of people to whom that had happened. Um, I think the most unsettling thing to me is when her lips start getting like really disgustingly chapped. Like yeah. in the early like um, medical testing scenes. It's just uh, that really gets under my skin. Speaking of getting under your skin, some of the wounds sustained <laughs> by Reagan during the possession were simple to achieve. Like the branding on her arm, which is just a top layer of latex that they pulled off with wires. Um, the other ones, like when the words help me appear on her stomach, uh, also deeply unsettling, that was a false stomach that they built out of latex and they, they scratched the letters in first and then used a hairdryer to make them, um, sort of recede. And then the shot you see in the film is that whole process run in reverse. I think it's so That's brilliant. So interesting. Uh, Smith also helped special effects supervisor Marcel Vercouter with the latex dummy built for the head rotating scene. Uh, Disgustingly, the thing had a condom in its throat to make it look like it was breathing, and a tube that blew warm air through it so that it would generate steam. Vercouter, in the 1998 BBC documentary about the film, The Fear of God, said that they tested this thing by placing it in the front seat of a taxi in New York, and then when enough people were looking at it, they made the head spin. And when that got the desired reaction, they said, okay, it'll work. It was one of the only things that made Linda Blair, who is otherwise a champ with the rest of the horrifying material in the film, uncomfortable. Speaking of uncomfortable, the projectile vomiting scene has become one of the defining images of the film. Uh, Freakin explained in a 2008 interview with DGA Quarterly, Over the years, everyone refers to the vomit here as pea soup, but it was really porridge with pea soup coloring. It had a much better texture than pure pea soup. The brand they used for the pea soup was Anderson's. They tried Campbell's at first, but found it wanting. We used a very thin plastic tube that ran from the side of Linda's mouth, underneath her nightgown, down to the floor, where a special effects technician was stationed with a jerry-rigged pump and a hand crank. On cue, she would tilt her head the right way, and he would pump the stuff up through the tube, seemingly out of her mouth. The consistency of the porridge is what determined the speed at which it would move through the pump. The actual take is in the film is something of, uh, it was either a mistake or another of Friedkin's acts of wanton cruelty. <laughs> in every rehearsal, the mix landed squarely on Jason Miller's chest, and he was reassured that it would do that when they were actually filming. But when the cameras were rolling, it hit him in the face, and his horrified reaction is completely genuine. And also, I just want to say, we, we mentioned earlier that shot of uh, Father Marin arriving at the McNeil home with his suitcase being silhouetted in the streetlight and the mist is all... Dun, 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 dun. It's so iconic. It's awesome. I love it so much. That was coming from Blatty's description as Marin as a melancholy traveler frozen in time. And Friedkin wanted to recreate um, a painting by Belgian surrealist René Magritte, otherwise uh, most famously known for... Uh, ce n'est pas une peep. And for the Apple Records logo. And the Apple Records logo, yes. Um, it was a painting called Empire of Light. Oh, and yeah. so he gave uh, Owen Roisman, the cinematographer, the whole day to light the scene. Uh, they had to remove the window frame from the facade that they'd built on the house, 
replace it uh, behind the window, and then put a spotlight in between the two layers to illustrate that specific spot where Marin would be standing. And then they also had to flood the whole street with fog. And Roisman said that uh, as they set up for this shot, the wind started blowing, so they had to flood the street with even more fog. They also um, somehow upped the voltage on the street lights to get light coverage, which is like, I don't know how they, if you had to apply to the city to do that. Um, and then got it in the first take. Proper preparation. Uh, they also talked about the levitation scene, which they did with wires. Uh, Roisman said he wouldn't have had an issue hiding wires with lighting and background colors, but because of the way Freakin wanted it, um, Linda Blair was levit actually being lifted through multiple extremes of background light and shadow made him very difficult to hide the wires that he said they had to go in and practically paint frame by frame. He said it was like doing a retouching job all the way through. God, what a pain in the ass and worth it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, before we get into the music of The Exorcist, we should take a look at its sound design, which won the film one of its Oscars. I think won two. Friedkin circumvented normal union rules by hiring the film sound team, Bob Fine, Gonzalo Gariva, and Doc Siegel, and Ken Nordine, and Ron Nagel as separate contractors. He was not going to play by even the most basic levels of union rules for making a film. Okay. Uh, Ken Nordine, who we mentioned earlier, was not credited in the film, in a theme you should probably recognize by now, and sued Warner Brothers, receiving a cash settlement in lieu of a credit. I've lost count of the number of people who weren't credited <laughs> and had to settle for an undisclosed cash payout. Supervising sound editor Cecilia Hall said, The Exorcist was one of the first films to understand the importance of affecting the audience psychologically. William Friedkin said he wanted it to be too loud because he wanted the audience to be slightly on edge in the middle of the film, in the beginning of the film, and the end of the film, pretty much through the whole film. Volume aside, Ron Nagel used a number of unconventional methods to get the effects in the film. He recorded a bunch of bees he'd shaken up in a jar and the sound of his girlfriend's stomach after chugging a glass of water. The scratching sounds in the attic, heard several times throughout the film, were a layery construction of, quote, guinea pigs running on a board covered with sandpaper, the scratching of fingernails, and the sound of a bandsaw as it flew through the air. Who thinks of this? Foley I mean, I artists. wonder how much of it's trial and error yeah. versus like, oh, wow. I mean, that's like fully worked to the extreme. I love it. I love that stuff so much. Sound me design too. is such a joy to me. Just because it's fun to imagine these guys just like on a set being like, yeah, turn that bandsaw on and throw it through the air. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Anybody got any guinea pigs? <laughs> I got an idea. We could take them back, right? <laughs> Get receipts. <laughs> Gonzalo Gariva created the sound that was made when Reagan's head did its 360 degree turn by taking his old cracked leather wallet and twisting it back and forth against a microphone. Gross. We gotta splice that in. <laughs> Who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Damien! <laughs> and as we alluded to earlier, there were actually two scrapped versions of the film's soundtrack. Freakin's first choice was Bernard Herrmann, the composer of Psycho and dozens of other iconic film tracks. Their initial meeting did not go well. To hear Friedkin tell it, he basically met someone who was as much of an abrasive egomaniac as he was. <laughs> he showed Bernard Herman a cut of the film, and afterwards Herman supposedly told him, I might be able to help you with this piece of sh**, but you have to leave it with me, and I'll see if I can come up with something. Herman compounded this uh, faux pas, if you will, by telling Friedkin that the film's opening scene in Iraq needed to be cut. And then he wanted to score the film with a church organ, which Friedkin rightly felt was a little on the nose. So Bernard Herrmann was out. For what it's worth, Herman later said that Friedkin wanted equal billing with him for the score. Oh, I can see a film composer not really wanting to share that with the film's director. Next, Lalo Schifrin, legendary film and TV composer, probably best known for the Mission Impossible theme. Any other big ones I'm missing? Uh, I think of him as Bullet. Basically, any like seventies oh, yeah. and end of the dragon, like any seventies like funk influenced mm -hmm. score was probably Lalo or you know Isaac Hayes. Oh yeah. 
Layla Schifrin completed a six-minute score with an 80-piece ensemble, and we already mentioned how that went. Uh, Freaking tossed the tape into, what, an alleyway behind his editing building? A parking lot. Parking lot? Calling parking lot. F***ing marimba music. <laughs> In a 2005 interview, Layla Schifrin said of the episode, In the past, we had an incident caused by other reasons, and I think Friedkin wanted vengeance. Which I love. Yeah, they had some kind of past predating. What, what happened? Exorcist. Maybe it was French Connection. Oh, maybe. So Friedkin, as he told the Castle Frankenstein magazine, which you mentioned earlier, decided, quote, Rather than get bad imitation Stravinsky, I might as well have the real thing. Ouch. Yeah, it's like a it sounds like a huge diss on Herman more than uh, more than yeah. Schifrin. Um, so Freakin descended on the music library at Warner's uh, and actually assembled an array of composers that are considered like the 20th century canon bedrock of of like contemporary classical. Uh, Christoph Penderecki in particular has become a huge totem in horror movies. Um, Anton Webern is one of the um, or Webern was one of the uh, pioneers of 12-tone serialism under uh, Arnold Schoenberg. And uh, another composer named Hens Werner Hens, <laughs> which is, I just wanted to mention because of his name. And your beloved Jack Nietzsche. Yeah. Who uh, worked with Neil Young and the rest. Phil Spector. It's something like just ambient piano passages that underscore transitions. Um, and Freakin wrote in his autobiography that Nietzsche arrived uh, at one particularly uh, cruel method to get a particular sound. During a recording session, Nietzsche's girlfriend was sleeping face down on a couch. Jack placed a microphone on the floor next to her and ran across the studio and jumped on her back, landing with both knees. <laughs> her shocked reaction is the sound we used when Reagan throws up on Father Karras. What is it? Perhaps tickled by this display of man's unfathomable cruelty, Friedkin would work with Nietzsche again on cruising. How many spines were ruined in this I movie? I know, right? Like, got Lid, three Linda Blair, spinal you injuries. Got Persons, you got Jack Nietzsche's girlfriend. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and Pendereski is in particular has become this big touchstone in horror. There's like, one of his works uh, in particular has been reused, uh, not just in this, but Stanley Kubrick also used a segment of the same work in The Shining. David Lynch has used Pendereski in four separate projects. Um, and despite all of this, there were only 17 minutes of music in this two-hour film, including, yes, Tubular Bells. To hear Freakin' tell it, I felt the need for something that was akin to Brahms's lullaby, a kind of childhood film. I went to see the head of Warner at the time, and he didn't know what the hell I was talking about. So he said, go into that room over there, the music library. <coughs> I went through the stack until I came to this thing called Tubular Bells by a guy named Mike Oldfield, and Warner had no interest in it, was not going to release it. It's a narration record. Because right after I played Tubular Bells, Mike Oldfield starts narrating and talking about Tubular Bells, what they are, and how they sound. But I listened to that refrain, and it hooked me, and when they won the rights to it. Uh, that's not in a, that's not correct, but we'll, we'll address that in a moment. Uh, Tubular Bells, though, is, is a hilarious and ponderous piece of prog rock cheese. The entire album is 49 minutes long and contains two tracks. Oldfield was just 19 when he recorded it and plays most of the instruments on it, uh, totaling 274 overdubs. Um, hilariously, despite the album credits for things like speed guitars, fuzz guitars, and guitars sounding like bagpipes, there is only one guitar on the record, a Telecaster that had previously belonged to Mark Bolin of T-Rex. Uh, Mike Oldfield was like a guy in the kind of London prog rock scene in the uh, early 70s. I, he had played with... Um, I don't know, one of those jerk-offs uh, was just like a studio guy. Um, there, my favorite thing from the liner notes is there's a credit for something called Glorfindel guitar. Uh, Glorfindel is, yes, the name of a Lord of the Rings elf and was the nickname given to a custom fuzz box that was given to Mike Oldfield. Um, the, the aforementioned narration about the record on the record is Vivian Stanshall, formerly of the comedic rock group 
Bonzo Dog Doodah Band. Fans of the Beatles who have seen the Magical Mystery Tour will know the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band for the strip club scene in that film. I'm literally... He was also a close friend of Keith Moon, too. I'm literally never going to listen to a single recorded work of that band because I hate that name so much. It pisses me off to no end. Uh, Oldfield told The Quietus in a 2011 interview, I didn't design Tubular Bells as a piece of scary movie music, although I was pretty paranoid at the time. I was only 19, and I had a lot of psychological problems and phobias. Uh, the piece's linkage with The Exorcist, though, doesn't bother him, he added. I'm quite lucky, because eventually as performance royalties come in, the payment after Halloween is always quite comfortable, and having that for something <laughs> I designed 40 years ago in a little tiny room in a horrible part of London is quite nice. Uh, Tubular Bells is also quite important in the legacy of just British recorded music, period, because Richard Branson and his business partner Simon Draper heard demos of Oldfield's work and offered to pay for professional recording. After shopping the finished product around unsuccessfully, the pair decided to start their own label, Virgin Records, to release the album. Released in the UK in May of 1973 and in North America in October 1973, sales were initially slow, but that situation changed following the release of The Exorcist in December 1973, the album has gone on to sell 15 million copies worldwide, basically launching Virgin Records and foisting Richard Branson on us all. The pair's relationship <laughs> did deteriorate, though. I think uh, Branson was so desperate for a follow-up at one point. This is from a, an anecdote from the book um, The Show That Never Ends, which is a really great uh, piece of music writing about the prog rock era. Uh, Branson drove, I think, a... Rolls Royce Phantom or like one of these obscenely rich guy cars drove it to Mike Oldfield's house and was like do you have anything to follow up tubular bells I will leave this car here as an advance on a down payment and take a cab back to London um, and things got so bad that by 1990 Oldfield inserted a message in Morse code in his album Amarok that read F off RB <laughs> But at least of a twenty four, at least as of a twenty fourteen interview with, I think the Guardian, he said he still got to fly first class on Virgin Airlines for free. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in Easy Riders: Raging Bulls, it's recounted that after a screening of the completed film, Warner's exec John Calley said, "What in the f did we just see?" <laughs> at the film's first sneak preview, cast and crew were stunned to find viewers screaming and running out of the theater. The production designer, Bill Malley, said, When it was over, nobody applauded. Everybody just sat there. They still didn't know what they'd seen. Shockingly, though, when it was submitted to the ratings board, despite the then and now graphic violence, <laughs> the film got an R rating instead of an X, largely due to the head of the board at the time, Dr. Aaron Stern, who supposedly called Freakin' and said the film should be, quote, widely seen. However, his successor at the ratings board, Richard Hefner, differed, saying... How could anything be worse than this? And it got an R? Uh, Warner Brothers was understandably skittish about the film and offered no test screenings, releasing it at only 30 screens across 24 theaters. The film's word-of-mouth popularity quickly forced them to expand, and without getting into what I consider the tedious details of film distribution, it should be noted that with its various re-releases, The Exorcist has grossed and adjusted eight and a half billion dollars worldwide it remains warner brothers second highest grossing movie of all time behind checks notes barbie i love that that's their one two punch <laughs> yep they should do double features man i'd see barber cyst <laughs> um that's better than barbenheimer x or b barber cyst barber cyst yeah um this was despite various bans against the film your beloved boston uh, and Hattiesburg, Mississippi were uh, kindred spirits in attempting to prevent local <laughs> showings with police arresting the projectionist and manager of the theater after the film's first Hattiesburg showing and fining them. Wow. The film was also banned in parts of Wales. And when it was resubmitted for a British home release after the landmark British Video Recordings Act of 1984, uh, which led to the so-called Video Nasties era, the film was banned entirely, and it was unavailable legally for 10 years. Yeah, it was up there with, like, a clockwork orange. And, and like, also really awful shit, like, uh, street trash. All the like, yeah, like, all the uh, faces of death, like, all the really uh, f***ed up exploitation movies. 
I guess there were some towns in the UK where it was allowed to be screened, giving rise to exorcist bus trips organized by local travel companies. I just cannot believe that this film had the legs that it had. Like, you would think mm. after seeing it for the shock value, it might not last. But it's yeah. a testament to its quality that it did because people were showing up repeatedly. Um, and another half of the film's legacy is, of course, the madness that happened when theaters started screening it uh, widely. Um, and it, it must be said that that basically this forced the studio to put it into wide distribution. <laughs> uh, 30 theaters is nothing, you know? And, yeah. and once they saw how theaters were being shut down by the demand for this film, they pushed it wide. But people were standing in these enormous lines to see it. They would light bonfires on the street to keep <laughs> warm while they waited in line and try and bribe their way upside. Once inside, they would faint, run out of the theater to vomit. Uh, one headline from uh, February 1974 said a viewer had fainted, hit the armrest of his seat and broken three ribs. A New York Times headline that year said a security guard had told a reporter that several people suffered heart attacks. One woman had a miscarriage. One viewer actually f sued Warners uh, after fainting and breaking their jaw. <laughs> Studio settled out of court. Theaters in Toronto reported that they had plumbers on standby for vomit-clogged toilets and sinks, as well as ambulances outside the theater. Um, meanwhile, parishes across the country have reported increased calls from congregants requesting exorcisms or simply just people flocking back to the church in droves <laughs> after being scared stiff by the film. Scared straight, I guess, if you will, in the parlance of modern times. Um, my personal favorite clipping from this era that I alluded to earlier was a theater manager in Chicago met his wife when she fainted into his arms during a screening of The Exorcist. <laughs> And they were married two months later. <laughs> That's just too precious for words. Yes. Well, this isn't. <laughs> An early version of the film's poster featured Reagan's hand with the bloody crucifix uh, with the tagline, God help this girl. The poster was rejected by William Friedkin, supposedly because it included the word God, which he thought should never be used in ad copy. How cute of him. I know. Not the bloody crucifix, but the word God was what bothered him. Warners campaigned heavily for the film at the Academy Awards and were rewarded with nominations for Best Picture, Director, Actress, Supporting Actor, Supporting Actress, Adapted Screenplay, Art Direction, Set Decoration, Cinematography, Editing, and Sound. It was the first horror film to be nominated for Best Picture, though it ultimately only won for Adapted Screenplay and Sound. George Cukor, who'd won uh, a director for My Fair Lady, as well as directed Philadelphia Story, the Judy Garland version of A Star is Born, and a bunch of Catherine Hepper and Spencer Tracy joints, threatened to resign from the Academy if The Exorcist won Best Picture, which I love. Can't take the heat. Get out of the kitchen, bitch. <laughs> the film had less positive impact elsewhere. Blatty sued Warners and Freakin over credits and supposedly being barred from production at one point. Blatty's name was added, and he eventually dropped the suit though he and Freakin fell out and didn't talk for years afterwards. And I think Freakin retaliated by saying, you were not banned from production, you were banned from post-production. <laughs> <laughs> Linda Blair, meanwhile, was given a security detail for months after the film uh, by the studio after receiving death threats. A cop was stationed at her home. When the movie came out, the amount of pressure that came down on me wasn't anything I was prepared for, she told The Independent. This year... Especially all the pressure the press put on me. They thought I had all the answers about faith and Catholicism. It was probably the most awful thing you could imagine. Unsurprisingly, Blair spiraled. In 1977, she was part of a massive drug sting that targeted 31 people for interstate cocaine trafficking. Uh, she did appear in the god-awful aforementioned uh, sequel to The Exorcist, The Exorcist Heretic, uh, alongside Richard <laughs> Burton, Louise Fletcher, and James Earl Jones. Uh, but she wasn't really able to sustain a, a career on the order of The Exorcist, though she did manage to date an impressive number of musicians, including Rick Springfield, who she met when she was 15 and he was 25, which, gross. No, didn't meet. I believe they were dating when she was 15 and he was 25. Gross. Reportedly, allegedly, legal reasons. Uh, yeah. Uh, she also dated Deep Purple bassist Glenn Hughes. 
Neil Spider Giraldo, the future uh, husband of Pat Benatar and her guitarist, Styx guitarist Tommy Shaw, uh, the lead singer of minor leagues classic rock dorks Black Oak, Arkansas, and lastly and most impressively, Rick James for two years, <laughs> who wrote the song Cold Blooded about her. Didn't think that was a connection we'd be making this episode. Um, sadly, Jason Miller struggled with alcoholism for years. He did reprise his role as Father Karras in the deeply underrated third Exorcist movie that I love has become a big cult classic. Um, when did that come out? 91? But he was so... That late? Yeah, but he was so... Uh, it's a great film. Uh, it has um, a, a deeply drunk and belligerent uh, George C. Scott in it as Father oh. Kinderman. And it's got all these... Because Blatty directed it and from his novel. So it's got all these really writerly touches, just these astounding stretches of like great dialogue. It's not particularly graphic. It has a very bizarre scene in which uh, Heaven is depicted as um, an all-white uh, set-dressed version of Grand Central in which Samuel L. Jackson, Patrick Ewing, and Fabio all have cameos. Um, but sadly, Jason Miller oh continued to struggle with alcoholism his whole life, and he was in such bad shape by the time this film came out that he basically shoots to what amount as cameos. And friggin' Brad Dorif, the voice of Chucky, uh, is in this film doing the load work for that character, and he is tremendous. He is so scary. Great film. Everyone go see The Exorcist 3. Or screen it. They just took all this shit off screening, by the way, which pisses me off to no end. It was all on Max for a few weeks, and you could see all of them. And they just took it off. So now you have to rent it. So, yeah. Miller sadly died at 62 of a heart attack, which related to his lifelong alcoholism, in his hometown of Scranton, Pennsylvania, where he had retired to a quieter life as director of a local theater. Max von Sydow and Ellen Burstyn obviously continued their distinguished careers. Um, Burstyn won her Oscar for Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore the year after The Exorcist. Uh, she also absolutely walks away with uh, Requiem for a Dream. Um, oh, yeah. That, that oh scene God. in which she delivers the monologue about wanting to be on the TV show is <sighs> devastating. And not just to me, you can notice in that scene where she delivers that monologue that the camera drifts slightly off center and goes a little bit out of focus before correcting. That is because she caused the cameraman to cry. Um, she also reprised her role as Chris McNeil in the absolutely piss poor Exorcist sequel that came out this year. Uh, David Gordon Green now has done damage to two of my favorite horror movies of all time uh, with the Halloween and and this one. Um, it is the official position of this show. I speak for both of us when I say, don't let that man near anything else. Give him Puppet Master next or, or um, <laughs> uh, um, I don't know, something far worse than this. Stop giving him prestige horror. Anyway. Uh, Ellen Burstyn famously this year made hilarious interviews in which she talked about the lengths that they, that Gordon Green and um, David Gordon Green and Blumhouse went to. The Warner Brothers, uh, Blumhouse paid $400 million, something like that, for the rights to The Exorcist, by the way. And this first film, I think, did maybe 100, 200. It, it did not, it underperformed. And they supposedly have th two more coming out because they were like, ah, give Gordon Green another uh, another trilogy to really get his creative vision for this out there. Anyway, Ellen Burstyn was like, no, I won't do it. No, I won't do it. Then they came back and she was like, double what you were offering, which is already, in her words, an obscenely high amount of money. And then she turned around and donated it as an endowment to uh, a master's degree program at Pace University which is such a power move. God love her. William Peter Blatty went on to write, adapt, direct, and produce The Ninth Configuration, which became a critical hit, but a commercial flop. I've never heard of it. He also wrote and directed, as you mentioned, the third Exorcist film, Legion, which became a cult classic and a favorite of my beloved Alex Heigl, <laughs> and continued writing extensively about the original Exorcist, as well as other novels as well. And he died in 2017 at the age of 89. 
William Friedkin's commercial fortunes declined post-Exorcist. He made Sorcerer, an adaptation of the French film The Wages of Fear, which flopped, but you say has undergone a critical reassessment. Yeah, that movie's wild. It's about truckers <laughs> driving a load of TNT uh, through the jungle. Um, it's scored by Tangerine Dream uh, <laughs> and stars uh, Roy Schneider. I don't know. I still haven't seen it. I probably should. Have you seen Cruising, which you also mentioned before? Which you I, have not, I have not seen Cruising. I... I would like to see. I, yeah, I kind of I, it's it's morbidly fascinating to me. We should do some kind of like watch party version of that. All right. I'm game for that. Uh, I'd like to watch that. He did To Live and Die in L.A. in 1985, which was a success. Though his career, for the most part, declined after that. He did have some late era success with a pair of Tracy Letts adaptations. Bug in 2006. Any crime film Killer Joe. He died just this year in August 22 days shy of his 88th birthday. So, I want to touch on one more thing here. Having basically invented the modern exorcism movie, which is still, like, you can't find a movie about an exorcism that doesn't mirror this. It's just really not possible. I will say, um, The Autopsy of Jane Doe is pretty good. Uh, kind of comes kind of close. It's a horror film about these guys doing an autopsy on a woman who was possessed takes place all in the in the uh morgue pretty cool Whoa. i think uh well brian yeah cox. brian cox is in it right great film so a little bit of background that's necessary and just one of my favorite bits about this um anecdotal reports from the time suggest that the crowds flocking to see the exorcist were at least one third black uh with one woman being quoted in the new york times as saying a lot of blacks relate to voodoo and witchcraft and that kind of devil stuff Many still believe in black magic, especially those from Haiti and the Deep South. And it gets more interesting because the film's skimpy distribution initially meant that in Los Angeles, the only theater in the area that could be found uh, to show the film was in Beverly Hills. And so Warner Brothers did not uh, anticipate that black people would want to see this movie. (laughs) And uh, he said in this book called Shock Value... That created a problem for Warner Brothers because it's playing in Lily White Theaters in Westwood, and all of a sudden, the merchants are seeing a huge number of African Americans coming to their enclave. We needed to open up theaters in black neighborhoods. A guy named Stephen Farber quipped in film comment that The Exorcist may have done more to integrate Beverly Hills than any civil rights action. (laughs) Some people have also theorized that The Exorcist uh, caused the inadvertent end of the black exploitation movie because this the era because the studios basically realized hey we don't have to make uh movies that are transparently and shittily catered to black people because black people will just see movies if they're good and this was a revelation to them because again hollywood is run by rich stupid children that all brings us to abby Abby is a film uh, directed by a guy named William Girdler, who in a six-year span from 72 to 78 made nine movies, three of which he also wrote himself. Some of his filmography are considered uh, minor exploitation classics like Grizzly, which was (laughs) essentially a rewrite of Jaws starring a bear instead of a shark. (laughs) <laughs> grossed $38 million worldwide on a $750,000 budget, making it the most profitable independent film of all time until Halloween comes out. Um, some of Girdler's other films starred icons like Pam Greer, Leslie Nielsen, and Tony Curtis. And Abby also stars William Marshall, who is most famous for Blackula and its sequel. And he's a great actor. He, if, you, if you ever see Blackula, he's like, gives this incredible like broadway-esque performance for something that is like he's the only person in there who's like this is not an exploitation film this is a serious damn role um abby is accordingly a straight up rewrite of the exorcist with the twist that they just substitute for catholicism the african yoruba religion uh and it is so on the nose that it was almost released according to some reports i read as the black exorcist which is admittedly catchier. (laughs) (laughs) That's not even a pun. Nope. It doesn't even... Isn't that a Simpsons gag where they're like, uh, next up, our black exploitation marathon continues. Blackula, Blackenstein, 
and the blunch black of Blotra Blom. <laughs> yes. Uh, Abby was a surprise box office smash during its short windows in theaters. It grossed nearly $4 million in just its first month and was noticed in the New York Times, was reviewed in the New York Times. Um, and Girdler, in a comment that would bite him in the ass shortly afterward, told the Louisville Courier Journal, Sure, we made Abby to come in on the shirt tail of the exorcist. Uh, that's like the, the Chappelle show thing where he's like Rick James being like, Yeah, I don't remember uh, grinding my boot heels into, into Liz's couch. Quick cut. Yeah, I remember grinding my boot, boot heels into his <laughs> white leather couch. Warner Brothers were indeed beset at the time by a flood of exorcist imitators, mostly from the usual suspects, by which I mean... Oh, wait, wait, I just, I just want to pause, I just want to something. Uh, William Girdler died soon after the success of this film. He died in 1978 at the age of 30 in a helicopter crash in the Philippines, about 30 miles from Manila, along with his producer. They were scouting film locations for a film about drug smuggling. And also the aforementioned... Uh, Grizzly? No, uh, William Marshall. Oh, yeah. He's best known to me as playing the king of cartoons on Pee-wee's Playhouse. Oh, yeah, right. I forgot he was also in that. So Warner Brothers were indeed beset by a legion of, uh, hey, pun intended, exorcist imitators. (laughs) um, Mostly from the usual suspects, by which I mean the filthy Spanish and Italian low-budget film industry. Um, Among the exorcist ripoffs flooding from those oily (laughs) shores were Spain's exorcism... (laughs) Italy's The Antichrist, re- released stateside as The Tempter, and a remake of Mario Bava's Lisa and the Devil, titled The House of Exorcism. All of those films were released in 1974. <laughs> they, they took a year. Not even a year. It came out at the, the end of 73. Months they took to rip it off. They probably watched it once and were like, yeah, uh, we're rolling. <laughs> Uh, One Italian co-production, Beyond the Door, opened in the United States in May of 75, and that grossed around $15 million before Warner sued them over it. But that suit dragged on until 1979, whereas when Warner's went after Abbey, American International Pictures, which is a famous low-budget uh, film studio from the time, caved immediately because they had already made so much money on it. The film was out of theaters by 1976, and Warner's were allegedly allowed to seize and destroy all copies of the film resulting it being unavailable through only, like, shitty rips today. You can, The movie is effectively lost. Um, Abby? Yeah. You can, I mean, you can see it, but it's just through, like, there's never been... I don't think they have an original print of it. That's amazing. There's God... Yeah. Yeah, Wikipedia page, Scarcity of Prints. Uh, in the end, the film is just a kind of fascinating curio because it was probably the first time that many white Americans were exposed to a truly original African religion in the the Yoruba culture that goes through the film, albeit directed by a white guy from Kentucky. So yeah, you, you take the good with the bad. All right. <laughs> Which is the end of the day, what you can say about the exorcist. <laughs> you take the good with the bad. True. Uh, aside from mentioning that this film is in the library of Congress film archives, baby. What else could we possibly say? It is a deeply resonant fable about spirituality and faith in the face of evil, and it helped legitimize the horror genre in ways we are still feeling today. And as one woman told the Associated Press in an interview conducted at the height of the film's mania, I don't know, I guess it was a good movie? (laughs) And People Magazine called it the feel-good movie of the year. (laughs) Folks, thank you for listening. This has been too much information, too much exorcism. This has been too much Satan, too much Pazuzu. (laughs) I'm Father Heigl. (laughs) And I'm Father Jordan. We are casting you out. We'll catch you next time. Your mother sucks in hell. (laughs) You thought I was going to make it through the whole podcast without saying it. Didn't you, you rube? Too Much Information was a production of iHeartRadio. The show's executive producers are Noel Brown and Jordan Runtog. The show's supervising producer is Michael Alder June. The show was researched, written, and hosted by Jordan Runtog and Alex Heigl. With original music by Seth Applebaum and the Ghost Funk Orchestra. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. For more podcasts on iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 